Hi, I'm John the Engineer Termel, running for Prime Minister of the Planet for a day so I can upgrade the bank's software and then plan my retirement poker game party that night. Ha ha ha, but an interest-free bank account would solve your problems, I would bet. And that's why I'm go doing this video here, going to watch the boys talk about the foreign policy and who they want to kill, who they want to surround, who they want to control, who they want to pressure. Some pretty ugly stuff we're going to hear tonight. And uh, I just wanted to point out that I'm John the Engineer Termel, and we're going to watch what happens between Mr. Howell, Silver Spooner, and with the Gilligan. Part 3 should be pretty ugly. When we welcome President Barack Obama and Governor Mitt Romney. The nice debate, as both of you know, comes on the 50th anniversary of the night that President Kennedy told the world that the Soviet Union had installed nuclear missiles in Cuba. Perhaps the closest we've ever come. As they installed nuclear missiles in Turkey to hit Russia. Every president faces at some point an unexpected threat to our national security from abroad. So let's begin. Oh, yeah. The first segment is the uh, challenge of a uh, changing Middle East and the new face of terrorism. I'm going to put this into two segments, so you will have two topic questions within this one segment on that subject. The first uh, question. And it concerns Libya. The uh, controversy over what happened there continues. Four Americans are dead, including an American ambassador. Questions remain. Who called off security? What, what caused it? Was yeah. it spontaneous? Was it an intelligence failure? Was it a policy failure? Uh, was there an attempt to mislead people about what really happened? Oh, Governor, he think, missed the big question. Nose for news. American policy in the Middle East that is unraveling before our very eyes. I'd like to hear each of you give your thoughts on that. Governor Romney, you won the uh, toss, you go first. Okay, do you remember in the last debate, the fella asked, hey, who pulled off the ambassador's security? Who set him up, basically? And did you see Obama dance around like, oh, we're going to get the guys who did it, but he wouldn't answer about what they're going to do, but the guys who set him up. Now, notice, no question about who set up the ambassador. Back to, what are you going to do about who did it? You know, ah. Oh. But don't forget, the itchy question is, who set up the ambassador by calling off his security? Was it Hillary or Barack? Thank you, Bob, and uh, thank you for agreeing to moderate this debate this evening. Thank you to Lynn University for welcoming us here, and Mr. President, it's good to be with you again. We were together at a humorous event a little earlier, and uh, it's nice to... Uh, maybe be funny this time, not on purpose. We'll see what happens. Um, uh, this is obviously an area of great concern to the entire world, and to America in particular, which is to see uh, a, a complete change in the, the, the structure and the, um, the environment in the Middle East. With the Arab Spring came a great deal of hope that there would be a change towards more moderation, an opportunity for greater participation on the part of women in, in public life, and in the economic life in the Middle East, but instead we've seen in nation after nation uh, a number of disturbing events. Of course, we see in Syria 3,000 civilians. Oh, Syria, where we like to attack again. We yeah. see in, in, uh, uh, in Libya uh, an attack. What about our dictatorships? Well, I think we know now why Bahrain. some kind against, uh, against our people there. Four people dead. Oh. Our hearts and, and minds go to them. Oh, yes. uh, Mali has been taken over the northern part of Mali by Al-Qaeda type uh, oh. individuals. Uh, that type. We have in, in Egypt a Muslim Brotherhood president. And so what we're seeing is a, a, a pretty dramatic reversal in the kind of hopes we had for that region. And of course, the greatest threat of all is Iran four years closer to a nuclear weapon. Oh. And, and we're going to have to recognize that we have to do as the president's done. I, I congratulate him on, on taking out Osama bin Laden and going after the leadership in Al-Qaeda. But we can't kill our way out of this mess. But we're going to have to put in place a very... Wait a minute, you sure trying? ...comprehensive and robust strategy to help the... Oh, comprehensive and robust and strategy. ...and parts of the world reject this radical, violent extremism, which is, it's certainly not on the run. It's certainly not uh, hiding that this is a group that is now involved in 10 or, or 12 countries, and it 
represents an enormous threat to our friends, to the world, uh, to America long term, and we must have a comprehensive strategy to help to have war with Al Qaeda forever. Inject this kind of extremism, Mr. President. Jesus. Well, my first job as Commander in Chief, Bob, is to keep the American people safe. And that's what we've done over the last four years. We <laughs> ended the war in Iraq, refocused our attention oh, yeah, yeah. on those it. who yeah, actually yeah. killed us. Yeah. Tell me about the mercenaries. They're left and behind. As a consequence, eh? Al Qaeda's core leadership has been decimated. Yeah. In addition, we're now able to transition out of Afghanistan in a responsible way, making sure that Afghans take responsibility for their own security. He calls that retreat. Yes, sir. They're going to take responsibility for their own security. <laughs> Just like Vietnam. That allows us also to rebuild alliances and make friends around the world. Now, most of you kids weren't alive in Vietnam when they were telling all these stories about how the South Vietnamese government was going to be there to take on the defense by themselves when the Americans leave after arming them as best they can and helping slaughter the indigenous people who were resisting right now till they left. So go read about Vietnam, that horror story of a war crime, you know. Started on a fraudulent attack, you know, Bay of Tonkin incident. What horror stuff. Three million people dead on a lie. To combat future threats. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, how much, if you really wanted to combat future threats, why don't you just make everybody wear handcuffs when they get on a plane, right? I mean, you could install so much security everywhere, gee, there'd be no threat from anybody. And that's what the beauty of a police state is. Everybody's in handcuffs, except for the few jailers and the millionaires who pay them, right? With respect to Libya, uh, as I indicated in the last debate, when we received that phone call, I immediately made sure that, number one, we did everything we could to secure those Americans who were still in harm's way. Number two, that we would investigate exactly what happened. And number three, most importantly, that we would go after those who killed Americans and we would bring them to justice. And that's exactly what we're going to do. But I think it's important to step back and think about what happened in Libya. I keep it in mind that I and Americans took the butcher of Libya. I mean, it was a beautiful, prosperous country, and he proved that 200 mercenaries calling in 30,000 NATO airstrikes can take out a small country and blow it all up. Yeah, they did. You ever notice always the pictures in Libya? It was with the pygmy press. You know, it was always pictures that were low down looking up at the sky with three rebels, you know. And it was, so I called it the pygmy press. They were always looking up and you never saw more than three guys in a picture calling in airstrikes by NATO. Yeah, easy to take out a small little country that isn't armed, isn't it? Anyway, that's the disgusting thing we did to Libya, one of the nicest little countries there ever was. Leadership in organizing an international coalition that made sure that we were able to, without putting troops on the ground, at the cost of less than what we spent in... Just the dropping the bombs. Liberate a country that has been... Liberate the them from their wealth. ...for 40 years. Got rid of a despot who had killed Americans. All right. All right. Now, that's a lot of bull. You know that. Is he actually going to talk about the disco bombing that was disproved, the Lockerbie that was disproved, all CIA frame-ups? Okay, I'm going to go out there and get my poem to Gaddafi. In all my study of history, Muammar Gaddafi was one of the few politicians I'd ever run into who didn't steal from his people. And he didn't kill people. And I did a little poem when he was being attacked because I thought it was important people should know how I felt about him. So... Obama, Harper, Cameron, Sarkozy, if they can, will kill Gaddafi's bad example, kill the honest man. Unlike dictators West supports, who steal from all with stealth, no thief is Muammar, he's loved for sharing oily wealth. He made them own homes, cars, and tools, free market to the test, mixed in with public services, that's socialism's best. He built a lot of hospitals with health care given free, with schools for education, home and foreign, pay no fee. The man-made river great he built, no tax to worry heads, no interest on loans and 50 grand to newlyweds. He gave up power to the people's conferences new, where all could speak their minds, a chance here only for the few. 
with UN human rights the best. What are complaints about? Paid malcontents by CIA are only ones who shout. Protect civilians from attack, United Nations said. A no-fly zone turned to bombardment, making many dead. By showing up our leaders as the failures that they are, to blow his earthly heaven up is reason why they war. So, YouTube for Gaddafi's Green Book and you'll find my analysis on it. And the best thing of all is Gaddafi is the one who financed the African satellite that allows those companies to offer all those cell phone users transfer of their cell phone minutes as a new kind of time currency for Africa. And every time they transfer a minute from my account to yours to do a deal, bankers got no interest. Thank you, St. Muammar Gaddafi, for financing Africa's satellite that sets them free. Now Obama's going to sit there and tell us why he had to kill him and be the butcher of Libya. And as a consequence, despite this tragedy, you had tens of thousands of Libyans after the events of Benghazi marching and saying, America is our friend. We stand with them. You had 1.7 million now, people in the demonstration. Tens of thousands. Of thousands. And, you know, Governor Romney, I'm glad uh, that uh, you agreed that we have been successful in going after Al-Qaeda. But I have to tell you that you know, your strategy previously has been one that has been all over the map and is not designed to keep Americans safe or to build on the opportunities that exist in the Middle East. Well, my strategy is pretty straightforward, which is uh, to go after the bad guys. <laughs> and make sure you are the very best Never to stop. interrupt them, to, to uh, kill them, to uh, uh, take them out of the picture. But my strategy is broader than, than that. That's, that's a Matt business Kim choice. Drones. But the key that we're going to have to pursue is a, is a pathway to, to get the Muslim world to be able to reject extremism on its own. We don't want another Iraq. We don't want another Afghanistan. That's not the right course for us. The right course for us is to make sure that we... He wants another the, Iran. The ...who are leaders of these various uh, anti-American uh, groups and these, these jihadists, but also help the Muslim world. And how do we do that? Yeah. A group of Arab scholars came together, uh, organized by the UN, to look at how we can help these, uh, the world reject these, uh, these terrorists. Oh, and the answer oh, thinking how to reject this, something. More economic development. We should key our foreign aid our direct foreign investment, and that of our friends, we should coordinate it to make sure that we... Let's use money! Can give pressure. ...economic development. Number two, better education. Number three, gender equality. Number four, the rule of law. We have to help these nations create civil societies. But what's been happening... It's pretty tough when you've just blown them years, up. ...as we watch this tumult in the Middle East, this rising tide of chaos occur. You see Al-Qaeda rushing in. You see other jihadist groups rushing in. <laughs> Everywhere you've blown up, bad people, the people are rushing in. Uh, Angry people, people are rushing in. Making some progress, despite this terrible tragedy. You know? But next door, of course, we have Egypt. Libya is 6 million population. Egypt, 80 million population. Oh, tougher to bomb. We want to make sure that we're seeing progress throughout the Middle East, with Mali now having North Mali taken over by Al-Qaeda, with Syria having uh, Assad continuing to assassinate or to kill his own people. Uh, uh, the, the same the story again. And of course, Iran, let's say uh, on the path to a nuclear uh, weapon. We've got real guests in that. But let's uh, get the president to change. How many people uh, believe that he's telling his people's Iran, story Iran. again? Because a few months ago, when you were asked, what's the biggest geopolitical... Gee, when you lied before, it's hard to believe you now, you know? Al-Qaeda, he said Russia. In the 1980s are now calling to ask for their foreign policy then, because... You know, the Cold War has been over for 20 years. Mm -hmm. But, Governor, you know, when it comes to our foreign policy, you seem to want to import the foreign policies of the 1980s, just like the social policies of the 1950s and the economic policies of the 1920s. You say that you're not interested in duplicating what happened in Iraq, but just a few weeks ago you said you think we should have more troops in Iraq right now. And the, the, the challenge we have, I know you haven't been in a position to to yeah, more mercenaries and more troops. But every time you've offered an opinion, you've been wrong. You said we should have gone into Iraq, despite the fact that there were no weapons of mass destruction. So did you? You voted for it too. You indicated that uh, we shouldn't be passing uh, nuclear uh, treaties with Russia, despite the fact that 71 senators, Democrats and Republicans, voted for it. You said that, first, we should not have a timeline in Afghanistan, then you said we should. Now 
you say maybe, or it depends. Uh, which means not only were you wrong, but you're also confusing and sending mixed messages both to our troops and our allies. So but what we need to do with respect to the Middle East is strong, steady leadership. We ain't leaving. Long and reckless leadership that is all over the map. Maybe and we're leaving. Unfortunately, that's the kind of opinions that you've offered throughout this campaign. That's right. Maybe and we're leaving. It is not a recipe for American strength or keeping like, America safe. We ain't leaving. I add a couple of seconds. Man, chair, give you a chance. We ain't leaving. Of course, I, I. We got those bases there now, and we ain't leaving. My own record and the things that I've said, uh, they don't happen to be accurate. But uh, but I can't say this that we're talking about the Middle East and how to help the Middle East reject the kind of terrorism we're seeing and the rising tide of terror. How to help reject. And, and, and attacking war. me is not an agenda. Attacking me is not talking about how we're going to deal with the challenges that exist in the Middle East and take advantage of the opportunity there and stem the tide of this violence. But I'll respond to a couple of things you mentioned. First he wants to make more war and stem the tide of the violence. is a geopolitical foe. Not only one, excuse me. It's a geopolitical foe, and I said in the same in the same paragraph, I said, and Iran is the greatest national security threat we face. Uh, Russia does continue to battle us in the UN time and time again. I have clear eyes on this. I'm not going to wear rose-colored glasses when it comes to Russia or Mr. Putin. All right. I'll bet anybody a hundred bucks to ten who wants to come online and bet me, and I bet you that the all the agencies say that Iran ain't building a nuclear weapon. Yes, the, everybody who can do peaceful development has the capability to do nuclear, but they'd be pretty stupid too when everybody wants to blow them up if they do, right? So that's why all the agencies report that they have no plans to and they haven't done anything yet, okay? Get that in mind. They don't want one or they're in big trouble, right? One little bomb against tens of thousands around them. Do they really want the bomb? I don't think so. So keep that in mind. I will bet. 100 to 10. Anybody wants to put up their money? Go out and show me where the uh, international <laughs> inspectors say that they're doing it, okay? Guess what? They all say they aren't. Are these guys delusional? Don't they read these reports? Or are they just liars? Isn't that sad, eh? On TV, national TV. I know I'm talking to posterity, you know. I mean, you're looking at these guys and they just... Anyway, it's shocking, isn't it? This is politics in the 21st century. And I'm certainly not going to say to him, I'll give you more flexibility after the election. After the election, he'll get more backbone. Number two, with regards to Iraq, you and I agreed, I believe, that there should have been a status of forces agreement. Did you? Well, you didn't, you didn't want a status of forces agreement. What I, what I would not have done is would have not have done. a thousand troops in Iraq that will tie us down. And that certainly would not help us. In the Middle East. I'm sorry, you actually, there was a, there was an effort on the part of the president to have a status of forces agreement. And I concurred in that and said that we should have some number of troops that stayed on. That was something I concurred with. That was your posture. That was my posture. He concurred with keeping troops in bases, right? I thought it should have been, right? been more troops. But you know what? The answer was we got no troops through whatsoever. Comes this is just a few weeks ago that you indicated that we should still have troops in Iraq. No, I didn't. Now that, sorry, that's it. I, 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 indicated that you, I indicated that you. Mercenaries are fine. Put in place a status of forces agreement at the end of the conflict that exists. Here's one thing I've thing I've learned as commander in chief. Right, You've got to be clear, both to our allies and our enemies, about where you stand and what you mean. We ain't leaving. You just gave a speech a few weeks ago in which you said we should still have troops in Iraq. Man. That is not a recipe for making sure that we are taking advantage of the opportunities and meeting the challenges of the Middle East. Now, it is absolutely true that we cannot just meet these challenges militarily. And so what I've done throughout my presidency and will continue to do is number one make sure that these countries are supporting our counterterrorism efforts with number our two, mercenaries make sure that they are standing <laughs> by uh, our interests in Israel's security because it is a true friend with our mercenaries and ally in the region number three we do have to make sure that we're protecting religious minorities and women because these countries can't develop unless all the population with not our mercenaries blowing up their homes number four we do have to develop their economic uh, their economic capabilities. After we've gone up their home. The other thing we have to do is recognize that we can't continue to do nation building in these regions. With war! Our leadership is making sure that we're doing nation building here at home. That oh, will yeah. help us. Bring the war home. Yeah, good idea.
American leadership. They are. Let me uh, interject a second topic question in this segment about the Middle East and so on. And that is, uh, you both mentioned, uh, alluded. Yeah, they are bringing the war home to the uh, American patriots. <laughs> You know, they've got their gulags ready to go, and uh, you just have to look at how fast they were set up in Russia to appreciate how much, and, and Nazi Germany, to appreciate how much faster they can be set up in gulag America. This and that is Syria. War in Syria is now spilled over into Lebanon. We have, what, uh, more than 100 people that were killed there in a bomb. There were demonstrations there, eight people dead. Uh, Mr. President, it's been more than a year since you saw, uh, you told Assad that he had to go since then. 30, oh, why, why haven't you done more for me? 300,000 refugees, the war goes on, he's still there. Oh, it's all his fault. We yeah. assess our policy and see if we can... <laughs> Not our mercenaries, no. Events there, or is that even possible? What a stat question, eh? Hey? What we've done is organize the international community saying Assad has to go. Why? We've mobilized sanctions against... Just like government. Libya, and you were wrong we there, too. We sure that they are isolated. Oh, I see. We have provided humanitarian... Don't deal with any reasons why, just deal with your conclusions. We're eh? particularly interested in making sure that we're mobilizing the moderate uh, forces inside of Syria. War criminals. But Someday this will be years that it's trial. Determine ...their own future. And so everything we're doing, yeah. we're doing in consultation with our partners in the region. And that makes it okay to kill a lot of people. We consult in what happens in Syria, coordinating with Turkey God will and get them. other countries in the region that have a great interest in this. Now, this what we're seeing taking place in Syria is heartbreaking. Oh, and that's yes. why we are going to do everything we can to, to keep our mercenaries funded. <laughs> but we also have to recognize that you know, for us to get more entangled militarily in Syria you know, is enough. a serious step. Yeah. And we have to do so making absolutely certain that we know who we are helping. Yeah, just let them call in the bombs like Libya. In the hands of folks who no boots on the ground. Against us or allies in the region. And I am confident that Assad's days are numbered. But what we can't do uh, is to simply suggest that, as Governor Romney at times has suggested, that uh, giving heavy weapons, for example, to the Syrian opposition uh, is a simple proposition that would lead us to be safer over the long term. Governor? Well, let's step back and talk about what's happening. All right, so in other words, funding resistance groups with armaments is okay if you think it helps you. And what would be the answer if it was done on the other shoe? Is that sad? Oh. In Syria, how important it is, uh, first of all, 30,000 people being killed Oh, anybody believe this? I've got 100 to 10 and ain't true, okay? Just because it's automatic, this is Romney, you know, this guy never tells the truth. 30,000 people they've killed? Come on. By their government is a... Oh, oh, no, no, okay, all right, I'll give 100 to 10, all right? Show me any kind of proof that make that number true, you know? A humanitarian disaster. And how come this never happened before now? Okay, through all those years of repression, how come there were no corpses like there are now? What's going on here? Secondly, Syria is an opportunity for us because Syria plays an important role in the Middle East, particularly right now. Syria is Iran's only ally in the Arab world. And we want it's to take them out. Sea. It's the route for them to arm Hezbollah in Lebanon, which threatens, of course, our ally, uh, Israel. And so Israel. seeing Syria remove Assad is a very high priority for us. Number two, seeing a replacement government being responsible people is critical for us. And finally, we don't want to have military involvement there. We don't want to get drawn into a military conflict. Oh, yeah, he and does. so the right thing is sure. working through our partners and with our own resources to identify responsible parties within Syria. And we can send them the guns. Bring them together in a, right. in a form of, of it, not, New not government. In a form of a, a council. A council. They can take the lead in Syria ah. and then make sure they have the arms necessary wow. to defend themselves. We do more criminal. Sure <laughs> and they don't have arms that get in the, the wrong hands. I bet you Those Obama doesn't admit this. Down the road. Is he stupid? We need to make sure as well that we coordinate this effort with our allies, in particular with. with, with That's Israel. right. Who we send the weapons to, important. And, Atari, and, and, and the Turks are all very concerned about this. They're willing to work with us. Oh, we yeah, need to have send a more weaponry than the rebels. Yeah. In Syria, making sure that the, the, the insurgents.
insurgents there are armed, and that the insurgents that become armed are people who will be the responsible for yeah, yeah, yeah. recognize. I believe that Assad must go. I believe he will go. But I believe we want to make sure that we have the relationships, the friendship with the people that take his place. Our guys. In the years to come, we see Syria as a, as a friend and Syria as a responsible That's party right. in the Middle East. This, this is a critical... With one of our dictators at the top, like all the other puppet regimes. ...the past year or so. First, the president saying, well, we'll let the UN deal with it. And Assad, uh, excuse me, uh, Kofi Annan came in and, and said, we're going to try to have a ceasefire. That didn't work. Then I looked to the Russians and said, uh, let's see if you can do something. We should be playing the leadership role there, not on the ground with military. Until later. Play the leadership role. We are playing Just drop the bombs. We organized the Friends of Syria. See? We are mobilizing we are sending humanitarian support and, and weaponry. The opposition. That's right. And we are making sure that those we help That's right. are those who will be friends our of friends. the long term. That's right. Of our allies in the region over the long term. That's right. But... You know, going back to Libya, because this is He's an example right, I mean, the right people. how we make choices. Yeah. You know, when we went into Libya, and we were able to immediately stop the massacre there because of the unique circumstances and the coalition that we had helped to organize, we also had to make sure that... Did, didn't he find out it wasn't true? Colonel Gaddafi didn't have to massacre anybody. They loved him. I mean, let's face it. If you, you got interest-free loans, free housing, free education, free health care, how much cake, hate could you possibly have? It's only a couple of hundred paid malcontents calling in, you know, strikes by the 30,000 air strikes on a small little country that they won. And now they're slaughtering the population in their prison. That, you know, So Gulag Libya is going on and we did it. And this man's trying to take credit for it and blaming Gaddafi with the original lie that wasn't true. But of course, the Yankees are so stupid, they don't know the truth. They were told. And only the few who dig it up know, find out, and they're going to be in a FEMA camp soon anyway, right? First to go. Walmart Gaddafi didn't have to say that. And to the governor's credit, you supported us going into Libya and the coalition that we organized. That's right. But the, the butchers of Libya, that's them, and he supported it. Both of them, okay? Both of them. Butchers of Libya. And it came time to making sure that Gaddafi did not stay in power, that he was captured. Governor, yours. Oh, did you know he was going to give up to Hillary, and as he was giving up, she ordered him killed? <laughs> didn't make the news, did it? That's why he put him out of hiding. He was giving up to Hillary. She was in town to take his surrender, and then she killed him and then laughed about it. The Witch of the West. The suggestion was that uh, this was mission creep. Didn't hear about it, right? This was mission month. <laughs> Imagine if we had pulled out at that point. Now, Muammar Gaddafi had more American blood on his hands than any individual other than Osama bin Laden. Oh, what a piece of trash, eh? What, Lockerbie? He didn't do that. You know, the case fell apart when the frame-up was exposed. You know, the Disco Berlin, uh, he didn't do that. You know, that was another frame-up. <laughs> Planet message, come on. Gaddafi never killed anybody. Oh, are you going to tell us whom in particular he was supposed to have killed? Or are you just going to go out there with a bald-faced lie? Come on now. Are you going to give us the truth? You're going to make a lie. And so we were going to make sure oh. that we finished the job. That's part of the reason That's why... Libya. He's bad. We say he killed a lot of people, more Americans than anyone else. No shit. Gee, Bin Laden supposedly killed 3,000 people. That means Muammar must have killed more than that. Wow. I wonder how he did that. Got your facts wrong there, Bozo. But we did so in a careful, thoughtful way, making certain that we knew who we were dealing with, that those forces of moderation on the ground were ones that we could work with. <laughs> the ones calling in the airstrikes on their cousins were people he could work with. <laughs> and we have to take the same kind of steady, thoughtful leadership when it comes to Syria. That That's right. The guys who were really good at calling in the airstrikes on their cousins, they're the guys we want at the top. Right? Right, Barry? That's exactly what we're doing. Uh, the governor, can I just say... Oh, by the way... His stance on marijuana also makes me puke. It's not going to come up, but tonight I bet, and even though it's a top, you know, hot topic in the United States, 
But when you see the book about him smoking through his whole adult, you know, high school career, you know, and all his experience with it, for him to still be out there busting people and pretending this stuff is dangerous, what a hypocrite. What a piece of dog shit, right? That's what your friends must think of you, Barry. Romney was Mormon. Maybe he didn't even get to try the good herb. Maybe that's why he's so, quote, crazy and needs to be stabilized by his wife when he goes off the deep end. Did you see that video? <laughs> Son says, yeah, he's got to be stabilized by mama. He goes crazy. Yeah, would you go what the administration would do, like, for example, would you put in no-fly zones over Syria? Oh, yeah, yeah, bomb them. Yeah, right. Remember the last no-fly zone? How many people knew it was going to be a bombing? What a piece of lying well, shit. I don't have our military involved in, in Syria. Uh, I don't think there's a necessity to put our military uh, in Syria at, at this stage. I don't anticipate that in the future. As I indicated, our objectives are to replace Assad. That's right. We're going to fund the underground, the send the rebels we weaponry. To us, we don't want to the take them out with no airstrikes. Make sure they get armed. They the make sure they get armed and they have the arms necessary to defend themselves, themselves from the but government they're attacking. The of, of our, of our wow. and this, this isn't, this this is guy is going to be, this is going to be shown in court someday, in the, in the world of the future. A war crimes court is going to say, is this man a war criminal for what he's talking about? And imagine if he's let loose on the world. We should have taken a leading role, not militarily, but a leading role. In financing the weaponry. To bring together the parties there, to find responsible parties. As you hear from intelligence sources even today. Wow. The, 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 Gee, isn't it too bad someone wasn't doing that to the United States? Let's take up a collection to find parties in the United States willing to do armed revolt to get rid of these lunatics. And we need to make sure they have Work both ways, right? to carry out the, the very important role, which is getting rid of Assad. Okay, okay, getting rid of them is an important role. Let's use exactly the same tactics. We'll have a collection to arm resistors in the states to take out these lunatics. <laughs> and that's because we're doing exactly what we should be doing, to try to promote uh, a moderate Syrian leadership and a, an effective transition. So that that's right. In other words, that's the kind of leadership we've shown. That's the kind more of guns. Yes. May I ask you... Make it uh, sound like there won't be know, guns, during the Egyptian Oh, government. just a transition, which doesn't mean regime change. It means, like, it'll manage to be nice. Some of your administration thought perhaps we should have waited a while on that. Do you have any regrets about that? No, I don't. Because I think that America has to stand with democracy. The notion that we will have uh, tanks run over those young people who were in Tahrir Square, that is not the kind of American leadership that John F. Kennedy talked about 50 years ago. But what I Look at the Occupy protests. Is that oh. Now that you have a democratic election, Americans supported dictatorships, you can't protest at all. Sure that they take responsibility for protecting Your their American supported government will kill you. Significant pressure on them to make sure they're doing that. To recognize the rights of women, which is critical throughout the region. Oh, These rights of women. Important issue when he ain't got food. Being blown apart. Have to abide by their treaty with Israel. Soon to be blown apart. For us. Because not only is Israel's security at stake, but our security is at stake if that unravels. They have to make sure that they're cooperating with us when it comes to counterterrorism. And we will help. There it is, make it war. To, uh, <laughs> the they're both going to make more war. It's going to make the Egyptian revolution successful. Warmonger nations. No shame at all, eh? For posterity, listening to these war criminals and how they think. Sure, they'll put up with war, they want jobs. They want to make sure that they have a roof over their heads, that they have the prospects of Oh, nice, decent, you emotions. And so one of the things that we've been doing is, is for example, organizing entrepreneurship conferences. Oh, conferences? To, to give them a sense of how they can start rebuilding their economy. Without any money. It's corrupt, it's transparent. Uh, conferences on how to get you know, for going once you get it. For America nice. to be successful in this region. <laughs> uh, there are some things that we're going to have to do here at home as well. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, here we go. You know, things we got to do. Over the last decade is we've done uh, uh, experiments in nation building in places like Iraq. Nation yes. building. <laughs> <laughs> for example, it's in ruins. Our own economy. 
all in energy sectors, all in <laughs> Nation building and in Iraq. It's very hard for us to project leadership around the world when we're not <laughs> doing what we need. Governor Romney, uh, uh, I want to hear your response to that, but I would just ask you... Nation you building in Iraq, Obama. that's got to be the line of the night. I believe, as the president uh, indicated and, and said at the time, that I supported his his action there. I Gilligan that, got the uh, I, I got wish we had, had a better vision of the future. I, Mr. I wish Howell. That, looking back at the beginning of the president's term, and even further back than that, that we'd have recognized that there was a growing uh, energy and passion for freedom in that part of the world, and that we would have worked more aggressively with our, our friend and with other friends in the region to have them make the transition towards a more representative form of with government. our guys in power. In way it did. Yes, always, but, right? But once it exploded. I felt the same as the president did, which is these, these freedom voices and the, the... Now remember, America's always in favor of democracy when they're going to win. But as soon as they're not going to win, they're not so in favor anymore. And that's the reason they had the Vietnam War. Because the reason after Second World War that Ho Chi Minh didn't keep on fighting was that he was promised an election throughout all of Vietnam, and he was the hero of the Second World War, and he would have won. But because he was also friendly with the Russians and the Chinese, the Americans decided, well, we don't want Ho Chi Minh, so we're not going to have the election. We agreed to it at the conference, but now we're going to decide we're going to divide this pipe piece in two, South and North Vietnam, and we're going to install a bunch of Catholics over all these, you know, unfortunate Asian uh, Buddhists, and uh, install our little military dictatorship, and then finance them, and have them take over and fight the North and all that stuff, and that's basically what happened. So, had an election taken place, he would have won, and there would have been no war. And the Americans called off the election and installed a dictatorship. So remember, whenever you hear them pleased with an election, it means because they're winning. And any time you hear about a complaint about democracy, it's because they're losing. I mean, it's the ultimate hypocrisy. All you have to do is say, after they say something, what's the most disgusting, nauseating, possible, hypocritical thing he could be doing and still say something like that, and that's probably what he's doing. It's like Ronald Reagan blaming the Nicaraguans for drug trafficking when it was his Contras doing. That kind of stuff, you know what I mean? The hypocrisy is always directly the opposite. So, I wanted to get that off my chest because Vietnam was a really dirty event which explained why democracy and elections, they only are happy about when they're winning. As soon as they're losing, they cheat, and they won't allow it. Get it? Democracy. Oh, wrong one. Streets of, of, of Egypt where the people who were, were speaking of our principles, and the, the, uh, President Mubarak had done things which were unimaginable, uh, and, the, and the idea of him crushing his people was not something that we could possibly uh, support. Let me, let me step back and talk about <laughs> Him crushing his people was not anything we could support any longer. They had supported him for his whole 30-year career of repression. And actually, it was a far worse dictatorship in Egypt than there ever was in Libya. Come on. But then again, Americans weren't told, so they don't know. They're the ultimate bourgeoisie. At least, and even more broadly. Because our purpose is to make sure the world is more peaceful. We want a peaceful planet. <laughs> Through we want war. be able to enjoy their lives and know they're going to have a bright and prosperous future. Yeah. Right after the war, they'll have a good time. A leadership for the promoting the. Sir, I've got to take out your village to say that. We didn't ask for it, but it's an honor that we have it. But for us to be able to promote those principles of peace requires us to be strong, oh. and that begins with a strong economy. That's right. And unfortunately, promote peace with war, with, with weapons and armaments. Of, of, of Iraq, actually, <laughs> hypocrite, uh, right? Says that our double makes us not a great country. Uh, that's a frightening thing, but the former chief of, uh, uh, chief of the... Uh, the All right. George Orwell coined the expression double speak and double think. Now, double think is pretty unique. It's the ability to keep two contradictory points of view in belief at once. So that you believe that this is red and this is blue and they're both at the same time. That's called double think. The only examples I know are in economics. Different story. Then there's double speak. When he says, we need to make peace through more strength and peace through more armaments to the rebels. And get the point? That's double speak. You'll hear many instances of it tonight, for sure.
Chief of Staff, said that uh, Admiral Mullen said that our debt is the biggest national security threat we face. This, we have weakened our economy. We need a strong economy. All right. We need now. For the record, it's not their debt. It's the interest on their debt. All they'd have to do is come to Casino Turmel and say, Mr. Turmel, we have 50 trillion in debt. We and we're going to owe an extra five trillion a year, and we'd like to settle it. Would you help us? So I'd say, sure, sign me an IOU for 50 trillion. Here's 50 trillion in chips. Go pay them off. Now all your payments go against principal to me, and you can earn them from them, but you're saving the five trillion a year in interest, and all your payments go against the principal, and someday your nation is out of debt. So that's all you got to do is switch from interest-bearing chips to interest-free chips, so all payments go against principal, and there is no problem with the national debt. So it's only the interest, which they never talk about. But the interest is the only problem. I don't mind paying my debt for stuff I got. I just don't want to pay any debt service because serving debt ain't the name of my game. Service charge, the yeah, labor's no, time, not the money's time. Our military is second to none in the world. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Terrific soldiers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Extraordinary yeah, yeah. technology and intelligence. Raw, raw, raw. We raw. have a trillion dollars in cuts through sequestration and budget cuts to the military. We changed that. We need to have strong allies. We need. Our association and, and connection with our allies is essential. Got to arm them. Strength. We're the, the great nation that has allies. The we armory of democracy and peace. Finally, we have to stand by our principles. <laughs> and if we're strong in each of those things, American influence will grow. But unfortunately, in nowhere in the world is America's influence greater today than it was four years ago. All right. And that's because we've become right. weaker. Uh, 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 this is perfect. You're going to get a chance to respond to that because that's a perfect segue into our next segment, and that is what is America's role in the world? And that is the question. What do each of you see as our role in the world? And uh, Blow up Iran. <laughs> well, I, I absolutely believe what else? that America has a, a responsibility and the privilege of helping defend freedom and promote the principles uh, that, that make the world more peaceful. By arming Those rebels to make war. Human rights, human dignity, Double speak. free enterprise, yeah, yeah. freedom of expression. In a war zone. Elections, because when there are elections, ah, his kind make money during wars, peace. profiteers. For war. So we want to, to promote those principles around the world. Big we money, baby, silver spooner, likes wars. We want to end those conflicts to the extent humanly possible. Sure you do. But in order to be able to fulfill our role in the world, America must be strong. Yeah, and need more arms. Yes, sir. And for that to happen, we have to strengthen <laughs> our economy here at home. You can't you have, have 23 million people struggling to get oh, a job. Can't have. You, you can't have can't an have. economy that over the last three years keeps slowing down its growth. What else rate. can't we have? You can't have kids okay. coming out of college. I know, can't have them. Who can't find a job. It's happening, but can't have it. A job that's commensurate with their college degree. <laughs> we have to get our economy. We have to, yes. And our military. We've got to strengthen our military long term. Ah, uh, there's the jobs for the kids. Down the road. Dead war heroes. We make decisions today in the military. That, that will confront challenges we can't imagine. In the 2000 debates, uh, there was no mention of terrorism, for instance. 2000 debates? So we have to make decisions based upon uncertainty. Oh, yeah, okay. And that means a strong military. I will not cut our military budget. Oh. We have to also stand by our allies. I, I think the tension that existed between... Oh, we have so many allies, we have to stand everywhere, everywhere now. Bases everywhere, everywhere. yes. Pulling our missile defense. You've already got bases okay. everywhere. And the way we you must keep them there everywhere is what you mean by stand by our allies. You must keep our bases everywhere. Some ways that existed between us. And then, of course, with uh, regards stand to by the allies, people, keep our bases. When, when the students took to the streets in Tehran and the people there Tehran. protested, the Green Revolution occurred. For the president to be the silent Green Revolution. was an enormous mistake. We have to stand for our principles, stand for our allies, stand for a strong military, and stand for... Died out pretty power. quick, right? America didn't have to be suppressed. The indispensable nation. And the world needs a strong America, and it is stronger now than what I can No, we don't need you. Because Not we at all. The Iraq, we were able... Excuse me. I mean, the world doesn't need the U.S. The U.S. is like a raving lunatic, want, the biggest guy in the block wandering around smashing like a deranged idiot that nobody can stop and we're all scared shitless of. Okay? You're a bunch of genocidal maniacs, and we're scared of you. So we focus our attention on not only 
the terrorists. Your hands are covered in blood, sir. The transition process in Afghanistan. It also allowed us to refocus on alliances, relationships that have been neglected. Ah, more are rebels to arm. Yes. Never been stronger. Ah. In Asia, in Europe, in Africa. They had a group called MEC, which was a terrorist group that attacked Iran. So they deregistered it, and they don't call it a terrorist group, and now they can send money to MET to attack Iran. <laughs> With Israel, where we had unprecedented military uh, and intelligence cooperation, including dealing with the Iranian threat. But what we also have been able to do... Is Isn't that sad? Always American-Israel dealing with the Iranian threat. When everybody knows there is none. Except for the two delusional national leaders. Position ourselves so and their opponents. <laughs> and that's what my plan does. Making sure that we're Making bringing sure. manufacturing back to our shores. Oh, man, so it's going to bring back jobs. We've done with the auto industry. It's going to bring back jobs without any new money for paychecks. I guess everybody will take a pay cut if he brings back more jobs. We don't have any more money, right? <laughs> now we're shipping jobs overseas, making sure that we've got making the sure best education system in the world. The best. Including retraining That's our what he wants. For the jobs of tomorrow. Including, yes. Doing everything we can to control oh, our everything we can. That's what he wants. Oil imports the lowest level in two decades. <laughs> so we're the best. Because we've developed oil and natural gas. Rah, rah, rah. To develop clean energy uh, technologies. That will allow us to cut our exports if, in half by yes. 2020. Oh, won't it be nice? That's the kind of leadership that we need to show. That's right. That can and solve we problems. And make sure that we reduce our deficit. And do this. Unfortunately, plan doesn't do it. <laughs> Not that it's yours. Way Not that it's his, right? Need, but also, <laughs> we want us to pay a little bit more. That way we can invest in the research and technology that's always kept us at the... They're both financial f f screw-ups, right? Cutting edge. Now, Governor Romney has taken a different approach throughout this campaign. Now, both at home and abroad, he has proposed raw and reckless policies. Now, he's praised George Bush as a good economic steward, and Dick Cheney as somebody who shows great wisdom and judgment. And <laughs> taking us back to those kinds of strategies that got us into this mess are not the way that we are going to maintain leadership in the 21st century. I know. They were a complete bunch of retards, and I even killed more people than they did. <laughs> no, actually, he didn't. Governor Romney, wrong and reckless policies? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> but he's going to try. Uh, I've got a policy for the future and an agenda for the future. And when it comes to our economy here at home, I know what it takes to create 12 million new jobs. Okay, so Bush must have killed about a million in Iraq. And what, uh, Obama might have killed... 40, 50,000 in Libya, you know, and, and whatever his drone strikes. So, you know, Obama's like 100,000 dead max compared to George Bush's million. So you'd almost say that Obama's a piker compared to, to Bush. But he's going to try. It doesn't mean he can't try and beat him yet. And Romney, wants, he wants to beat him faster. Jobs and rising take home pay. Oh, he's in, in favor of more jobs. Yeah. Want to see over the next four years. That's what he wants to see. The, the president said by now we'd be at 5.4% unemployment. Oh, he saw wrong. We're 9 million jobs short of that. Uh -uh. I will get America working again. I will. And see rising take home pay again. I'll do it with. With no money. <laughs> Number one, <laughs> we are going to have North American energy independence. Ah, we, we will, will have. We're taking full advantage of oil, coal, gas, we will take. and renewables. Yes. Number two, we're going to increase our trade. Oh, yeah. Trade goes about 12% per year and doubles about every every five or, or so years. We can do better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Double every five years? He doesn't understand how exponential functions work. That's insane to try and double your growth every five years. But then again, what, was he, what would he know about finite limits in a real world? God. He's thinking a money boy, 5% interest on my money, but he doesn't understand the world can't grow at 5%. Particularly in Latin America. The opportunities for us in Latin America, we have just not taken advantage of fully. As a matter of fact, Latin America's economy... Loan shark opportunities. ...is the economy of China. We're all focused on China. Latin America is a huge opportunity for us. Time zone, language opportunities. Tell it to the resources. We're going to have to have tra training programs that work for our workers. CIA boys. And schools that finally put the parents... Economic hitmen. 
and the kids first. And the go see that video. Have to go by. I know. Economic hitman. To get to a balanced budget, we can't expect entrepreneurs and businesses, large and small, to take their life savings or their company's money and invest in America if they think we're headed to the road to Greece. And that's where we're going right now, unless we finally get off this spending and borrowing binge. And I'll get us on track to a balanced budget. Oh. And finally, number five, we've got to champion small business. Small. Has anyone ever been able to defeat the exponential rise in debts they're faced, government debts, so that they're always faced with a rising budget? Throughout all of known history that you know for your life, do you ever remember this statement ever being true? That they would balance the budget. Do you remember being that true ever? I mean, that's a real whopper. That's an old whopper that everybody knows is a whopper, but I guess we've been hypnotized into forgetting it's a whopper. He's going to balance the budget. Ooh, sounds good, right? He wants it balanced. Oh, it needs to be balanced. Come from. That's where jobs, jobs come from. Come from small businesses. <laughs> New business formation is down to the lowest level. In Things are bad under this administration. I want to bring it back. I want to do it better. Give jobs and rising take home pay. <laughs> That's what he wants. Uh, first of all, Governor Romney talks about small businesses, but Governor, when you were uh, oh. in Massachusetts, uh, small businesses uh, development ranked about 48, I think, out of 50 states in Massachusetts. Because the policies that you're promoting actually don't help small businesses. And the way you define small <laughs> but businesses, they help big businesses. Uh, folks at the very top. Yeah. They include you and me. All right. That's not the kind of small business right. promotion we need. But, but let's take uh, an example that we Ouch. know is going to make a difference in the 21st century, and that's our education policy. Yeah, yeah. We didn't have a lot of chance to talk about this in the last debate. No. What do you got to say? You got no what money. What we've done is reformed education, working with governors, 46 states. We've seen progress and gains in schools that were having a terrible time, and they're starting to finally make progress. And finally what start. What I want to do is to hire more teachers. Especially he wants to hire. He's got no money. That we've fallen behind when it comes to that. But he wants to hire. And those teachers can make a difference. And then you say, oh, no now, money. Governor Romney, when you were asked by teachers whether or not <laughs> this would help the economy grow, you said this isn't going to help the economy grow. When you were asked about reduced class sizes, you said, Class sizes don't make a difference. But I tell you, if you talk to teachers, they will tell you it does make a difference. And if we've got math teachers who are able to provide the kind of support they need for our kids, that's what's going to determine whether or not... If if only we have more money to pay them with. Okay, you're depending on whether you've got the most highly skilled workforce and most the kinds skilled. of budget proposals that you put forward. Well, we don't ask... Either you or me to pay a dime more in terms of reducing the deficit, but instead we slash support for education. That's undermining our long-term competitiveness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is not good for America's position in the yeah, world. Him bad. Let me get yeah. back to foreign yeah. policy. Well, can I just get back? Well, no. I, I need this big moment. If okay. You let me provide just about education because okay. I'm uh, I'm so proud of the state that I had the chance to be governor of. Um, we have uh, uh, every two years tests that look at how well our kids are doing. Fourth graders and eighth graders are tested in English and math. While I was governor, I was proud that our fourth graders came out number one of all 50 states in English, and then also in math. And our eighth graders, number one in English, and also in math. Good for you. First time one state had been number one in all four measures. Not bad. How do we do that? Yeah, so tell us. Republicans and Democrats came together on a bipartisan basis to found some the money. Education principles <laughs> that focused on having great teachers in the classroom. How did you do that? That was, that, was a, that was what allowed us to become the number one state. As opposed to great teachers outside the classroom? Or bad teachers inside the classroom? So you've been able to focus on good teachers versus bad teachers inside or outside the classroom. Which kind of says nothing, right? What well, is the real answer? More money to do it right. In the nation. But that was 10 years before you took office. And, we've done absolutely. and then you cut it the first spending with the first office. Still number one today. Our, nice and the principles that we put in place, we also gave kids not just a graduation exam that, that determined what they were up to the skills needed to, to be able to compete, but also if they graduated in the top quarter of their class, they got a four-year tuition-free ride at any Massachusetts public institution of higher learning. That happened before you came into office. That was actually mine, actually. <laughs> Mr. President, you got that back wrong. I, I want to try.
try to ship this. No, no, no. If it was his, that was a good idea, you know. Governor, you say you want a bigger military. You want a bigger Navy. Uh, Navy's not completely uh, You don't want to cut defense spending. Uh, what I want to ask you, we're talking about financial problems. Well, it was started 10 what years before him, point? though. That's right. Well, let's, let's come back and talk about Work an idea all already. Way, all way through. First of all, right. I'm going through from the very beginning. We're going to cut about 5% of the uh, discretionary budget, excluding military. That's number one. All right. All right. The military that's keeps its money. You know, got to arm those business. rebels. Yeah, I'll be happy to have you take a look. Come on our website. You'll look at how we get to a balanced budget. Within eight to ten years, oh, we do it by getting eight to by ten years, spending yeah. a whole series of programs. By the way, nothing one, unexpected will happen here. <laughs> there are a number of things that sound good, but frankly, we just can't afford them. And that one doesn't sound good. Can't afford, afford something good. So I get rid of that one from day one. I, to the extent humanly possible, we get that out. We take program after program that we don't absolutely have to have, and we take cut, get rid cut, of them. cut. Number two, we no take money. Some programs that we are going to keep, like Medicaid, which is a program for the poor. We take that health care program for the poor and we give it to the states to run because states run these programs more efficiently. As a governor, I thought, please give me this program. Can I, can, that? I can run this more efficiently than the federal government and states, by the way, are proving it. States like Arizona, Rhode Island have taken these, these Medicaid dollars have shown just, they can run these programs more cost effectively. Uh, and but, so I want to do those two things. Do you really believe that in this era of computers and centralization that it's better to have all 50 states running on, coming up with their own numbers and legislations and stuff rather than have one big one? I don't know. I don't know. I really think that, you know, if you can do the one right, that one right is a lot smarter than 50 right, right? And, of course, one wrong may be worse than 50 wrong. We don't know, but one right certainly were better than 50 right. So I like the fi one right. Gets us, it gets us to a balanced budget with eight, in eight to ten years. Bob, but the military... Uh, let's, let's get back to the military, though. Well, 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 that's what I'm trying to... Well, ask ask about about I'm not gonna, you should have answered the first question. Uh, Look, Governor Romney's called for $5 trillion of tax cuts that he says... Oh, yeah, back to this line. Okay. By closing... It's going to come up to eight. Now, yeah. the math doesn't work, but he continues to claim that he's going to do it. He then wants to spend another $2 trillion oh, seven. on military spending that our military's not asking for. Now, fund those rebels. Our military spending has gone up every single year that I've been in office. We spend yes, more sir. on military yes, than the sir. next 10 countries combined. I know. China, the country's Russia, biggest warmonger. France, and they gave United, him a Nobel United Prize and he's making more Next wars time. than when he started. And what I did Take was to work the with our Joint Chiefs of Staff to think about what are we going to need in the future to make sure that we are safe. And that's the budget that we put forward. <laughs> we are safe means but make war on other people. What we can't do is spend $2 trillion dollars yeah. or well military spending that the military is not asking for. Double speak. $5 trillion dollars on tax cuts. Yeah. You say that you're going to pay for it by closing loopholes and deductions without naming what those loopholes and deductions That's are. That's right, it's got to come to seven. And then somehow you're also going to deal with the deficit that we've already got. The math simply doesn't work. I know, it's sad. But when it comes to our military... Basic algebra, they can't get right. Is not, you know, Gilligan's the explaining it to the professor. <laughs> I'm mean, I mean, to Mr. Howell. We need to be thinking about space. Yeah, Gilligan's exactly explaining it to Mr. Howell. Howell. It's driven by strategy. It's not driven by politics. It's not driven by members of Congress and what they would like to see. It's driven by what are we going to need to keep the American people safe. That's exactly what our budget does. And it also... How many rebels do we have to arm to keep our, 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 keep our people safe? A significant national security concern. Because we've got to make sure that our... How many people we've got to kill to keep our people military safe? ...military power overseas. Bob, I, I'm I killed all those people just to... I was in the world of business for 25 years. That's going to be his alibi in world court someday. I burned all those people to keep our people safe. They got it on balance and made a success there. And all those 1,600 out of 2,000 innocent people he groaned to keep our people safe. We balanced the budget. We cut taxes 19 times, balanced our budget. The president hasn't balanced the budget yet. Must be a rich province, a rich state. I'm going to do so myself. I'm going to be able to balance the budget. Let's talk about military money. And that's this. Our Navy, our Navy is older, excuse me, our Navy is smaller now than Navy 1917. Yeah. 
The Navy said they needed 313 ships to carry out their mission. We're not under 285. We're headed down to the to the low 200s if we go through a sea situation. More ships. I want to make sure that we have the ships that are required by our Our Air Force is older and smaller than any time since it was founded in 1947. Still 10 times bigger than everybody else, but smaller than before. We all since FDR we had the line we said this thing we could fight in two conflicts at once. Now we're changing to one conflict. Look, Everywhere. This, in my view, is the highest responsibility of the President of the United States, which is to maintain the safety of the American people. And I will not cut our military budget by a trillion dollars. That's maintaining the safety. combination of the budget cuts, the President has, other people. as well as the sequestration cuts. That, in my view, is, is, is making our future less certain and less secure. Oh, he'll First be worse than Obama. Obama. Not something that I propose, it's something that Congress has proposed. It will not happen. The budget that we're talking about is not reducing our military spending. It's maintaining it. That's right. But I think Governor Ron More than ever, too. We have to spend enough time looking at how our military Stop. works. Lots of American people starving for lack of money while he spent all that money on war making. Give him a break. He spent plenty on war making. Look at all those starving people in the streets. The nature of our military has changed. He knows his priorities. Yes. 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 Need more. Ships that go underwater. Forget people in the streets. And so the question is. Under bridges. Uh, a game of battleship Wait. where we're counting ships. It's it's what are our capabilities? And so when I sit down with the Secretary of the Navy and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, we determine how are we going to be best able to meet all of our defense needs in a way that also keeps faith with our troops, that also makes sure that our veterans have uh, the kind of support that they need when they come home. Oh, sure, yeah. And that it is, is so not successful in the kind of budget that we're putting forward because. It just doesn't work. Nor you, Barack. Um, you know, we visited the website. You failed to. And it still doesn't work. A lot to cover up. I'd like, <laughs> Good line. I'd like to move to the uh, next uh, segment. Uh, Red lines, Israel, and Iran. Uh, Would either of you... Stack the question, the sir. Minutes, and uh, President Obama, you have the first go at this one. Would either of you be willing... to Iran. ...an attack on Israel is an attack on the United States, oh. which of course is the same promise that we give for our close allies like Japan. Oh, so we should and if you made such a declaration, uh, would not bomb anybody. Iran. I thought they'd already the given it. Soviet Union. For Wasn't it already there? We made that. Uh, we made, we made that uh, Doesn't everybody know if anybody attacks President Israel, the Israel Americans are going to blow them up? is a true friend. Yes! Everybody knows that. Nobody can attack our true friend. Come on, our bully's always got a true friend. So you're, you're saying, uh, he's already made that declaration. I know, that's I right. I stand with Israel. Yes. He'll beat anybody up for her. Yes. Who's going to attack Israel with the big bully standing right beside? Between our two countries in history. Yeah. In fact, this week, we'll be carrying out the largest military exercise in Israel in history. This very week, but <laughs> why? No. Why? As long as I'm president of the United States, Iran will not get a nuclear weapon. I made that clear when I came into office. We then organized. All right, now I got to take a minute to say that he's once again resorted to being delusional and talking to the people that are stupid enough not to know the truth, right? So, people who aren't going to go, he's lying and he knows it, but he's already talking to stupid people, and I'm not one of them. The strongest coalition and the strongest sanctions against Iran in history, and it is crippling their economy. Yes, there it is. War crime. People are suffering. Human beings are suffering because of their underground war and their sanctions over a non-existent nuclear program they are imagining. Okay? We have imaginations, and we're concerned about things we imagine, and we've imposed these sanctions that are crippling Iran. He admits it. On TV, for the record, for his trial. Isn't it nice? The currency has dropped 80%. We've heard him the bad. The production has plunged. Oh, yes, so we're we're starving by now. With Iraq yeah, we're hurting, years ago. hurting them bad. So their economy is in a shambles. That's right, we heard him bad. The reason we did this is because a nuclear Iran is a threat to our national security, yeah. and it's a threat to Israel. I know, we've only got 20,000 nuclear weapons of our own, and for them to have one would be such a threat. We really had to blow them up and destroy their country with these economic sanctions. 
one nuclear weapon from Iran would be such a threat when we've only got tens of thousands. Oh, are you a piece of dog shit, sir? Uh, we cannot afford to have a nuclear arms race in the most volatile region of the world. Iran's a state sponsor of terrorism. And oh. Them to be able to oh, that's another lie. That's another lie. Okay, I got a hundred bucks to ten. That's a complete lie. Okay? I just don't believe it. You know what I mean? It's just uh, very, you know, shooting the mouth off to the home crowd who don't know the truth. You know, the, the brainwashed bourgeoisie. Provide nuclear technology to non-state actors. Oh yeah, sure they will. They don't have it themselves, but they'll provide it to others. Israel wiped off. No, that's not what uh, the, uh, the government, the regime, didn't want to kill the people. Now, offers a lot of choice. They can now, no matter what they say about wiping anybody off the map, Iran never attacked anybody, not for hundreds of years, and they've always left their Jewish communities alone. As a matter of fact, the greatest flowering of the Jewish community in all of history was under Muslim rule. Isn't that neat to know? Gee, most people don't know. But that's when the real flowering of Judaism took place because they were given their freedom by the Muslims. So, I mean, this stuff about Muslims being scary is really terrible. Kick me out some more, sir. Or they will have to face a united world and... A United States president, me, who said, we're not going to take any options off the table. That's right, boogeyman there, maybe we'll bomb you. Boogeyman, boogeyman, I see boogeyman. And Romney believes it. There's a difference. He knows he's lying. Maybe Romney believes it. Boogeyman, boogeyman. The disagreement I have with Governor Romney is that during the course of this campaign, he's often talked as if we should take premature military action. I think that would be a mistake because I know, he's, as soon as he can, but not premature. I always understand that that is the last resort. Yeah, yeah, not sure. Remember Libya? No fly zone to prevent deaths becomes bombardment zone causing deaths. <laughs> what a lying hypocrite. Well, first of all, um, I, I. Butcher I, Olivia, I, I, line again. Point the president made, which is that if I'm president of the United States, when I'm president of the United States, ah. we will stand with Israel. And and if Israel is attacked, we have their back. Brown uh, knows as you can, it. sir. Uh, just culturally. Brown knows are extraordinaire. Uh, God, he's got a browner nose nuclear than Obama does. does. <laughs> There's no question but that a nuclear Iran, a nuclear capable Iran, is unacceptable to America. <sighs> it presents uh -huh. a threat not only to our friends. Did you notice what he said? Nuclear capable. So Iran is already nuclear capable because every country, Canada's nuclear capable. So he's just said that he wants to be able to bomb Iran if, because of the condition they're in right now. Right? They are nuclear capable. And he wants to stop them from being what they already are. Now, if that isn't a declaration of war, what is? Sir, I can't wait to see your war crimes trial in heaven. But ultimately, a threat to us to have threat to have us, nuclear yeah. material, nuclear weapons that can be used against us or they used to be. Well, we've only got ten thousand of them. It's also essential <laughs> for us to understand what our mission is in Iran, and that is to dissuade Iran from having a nuclear weapon through peaceful and diplomatic means. Now, it cannot be true when their own intelligence agencies are telling them that Iran isn't building any nuclear weapons, and it would be stupid for them to do so. Can that possibly be true, what he just said there? They really just want to dissuade Iran from having nuclear weapons when they've been told that they're not doing it. Ah, oh, the lies, it never ends. It's like theater, right? They're like puppets saying what they've been told, a script. Talking points, right? Crippling sanctions are something I called for five years ago when I was in Israel speaking at the Herzliya conference. I laid out seven steps. Crippling sanctions were number one, and they do work. You're seeing it right now in the economy. It's absolutely the right thing to do to have crippling sanctions. I'd have put them in place earlier, but it's good that we have them. Number two, something I would add today is I would tighten those sanctions. I would say that uh, uh, ships that carry Iranian oil can't come into our ports. I imagine the EU would agree with us as well. Not only ships couldn't, I'd say companies that are moving their oil can't, people who are trading in their oil can't, I would tighten those sanctions further. Secondly, I'd take on diplomatic isolation efforts. I'd make sure that Ahmadinejad is indicted under the Genocide Convention. His words amount to genocide inside tape. He's a lunatic. Well, 
He doesn't even know I'm a Dina Judge real words. <laughs> brown noser, brown noser. I would indict him for it. I would oh. also make sure that their diplomats are treated like the pariah oh. they are. I'm in time we need to treat Iran these guys like pariahs, eh? The Yankees like a pariahs, a the warmongers. Wouldn't that be a wonderful this, world? This nuclear folly of theirs is unacceptable to America, oh. around the world. Oh. The same way we treat Just wants to make war, eh? Fight with, with everybody. What an ugly man. Time and time again on Iran. Warmonger. Anything other than a... A, uh, Strength solution and love of peace. <laughs> this, this nuclear folly of theirs is unacceptable to America. Their nuclear folly, and isn't folly supposed to be a delusion? And isn't this the guy with the delusion talking about other people having follies? <laughs> a delusional guy complaining about other people's follies. <laughs> it is something, and of course, a military action. I mean, all this foaming at the mouth over a program that doesn't exist. Isn't that incredible? I mean, both foaming at the mouth like rabid dogs, you know, over Iran when it ain't even true. Isn't it sick? Actors, though. Now, this one might be stupid enough to believe it, but I don't, I don't think Gilligan is. Last resort. It is something one would only, only consider if all oh, yeah. the other avenues had been, had been yeah, tried. If arming the rebels doesn't work, then we'll resort to total war. As you know, there are reports that Iran and the United States as part of an international group have agreed in principle uh, to talks about Iran's nuclear program. What is the deal, if there are such talks, what is the deal that you would accept, Mr. President? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, those are reports in the newspaper. Uh, they are not true. No deal but he will accept. Our goal is to get Iran no deal. to recognize it needs to give up its nuclear program. Oh, and abide by the it needs to give up its civilian power program is what he's saying. Because it's all they got, right? Now, he doesn't call it the civilian power program because the homies don't know. They think he's talking about nuclear weapons when he talks about their nuclear program. They don't, the homies don't know he's talking about their power program, okay? Their civilian power program when he talks about a nuclear program. What a skillful, cunning liar, isn't he? UN resolutions that have been in place because they... And nobody's found any infractions by Iran at all. And yet they've managed to get sanctions through the United Nations, which just tells you how corrupt an organization that must be. <laughs> they have the opportunity to re-enter the community of nations. Oh, yeah. And we would welcome that. Yes, you would, there, yes. There are people who <laughs> sure have the same aspirations as people all around the world. We don't want to have and nuclear energy. energy. No, sir. Yeah. No nuclear power. We hope that their leadership takes the right decision. But the deal will accept if they end their nuclear program. Oh. It's very straightforward. Notice again, he didn't say nuclear weapons, he said nuclear program, so the homies don't get it. And, you know, I'm glad that Governor Romney agrees with the steps that we're taking. Uh, well, of course he's a lunatic too. During the course of this campaign, where uh, it sounded like uh, you thought that you do the same things we did, but you'd say them louder, and somehow that, that would make a difference. And it turns out that the work involved in setting up these criminal sanctions yeah. is painstaking. That's it's right. Famous. That's right. We started from the day we got in office. To hurt their people so takes so a lot of work, you know. This a to, to commit this war crime, and economic genocide in public on TV. Yes. We had to make sure that yes. all the countries participated, even yeah. countries like Russia and China. Because if it's just us that are opposing sanctions, we've had sanctions in place for a long time. Well, we should it's put sanctions on the United States, eh? Until you stop making yeah. war on everybody. Get your bases out of everybody's home so backyards. And we've got to maintain that pressure. Oh. There is a deal to be had. And that is that they abide by the rules that have already been established. They Which they're doing, so he's lying again. They convince the international community they are not pursuing a nuclear program. Oh, but of course they have one. So how can they ever convince the nuclear community they're not pursuing a nuclear program when they have one. So he's saying that because he's never going to specify nuclear, he's ready to make war on Iran, period, over the civilian nuclear, because he's got the homies fooled. It's not what he's saying. This war criminal, who someday is going to be in a court, 
in the eyes of posterity? There are inspections that are very intrusive, but over time... That's right! And they've found no indication of a nuclear program, which would be pretty stupid, right? <laughs> How is he going to... Oh, a little bit of truth got out. What's he going to do to cover it up? What they can do is re uh, regain credibility. In the meantime, though, we're not going to let up the pressure until we have clear evidence that takes place. And one last thing. Notice he never actually specifically says nuclear weapons program. Isn't he skillful? Just, just, just to make this point. The clock is ticking. That's right. going to make we're war soon. to allow Iran to perpetually engage in negotiations that lead nowhere. And I've been and very clear. a nuclear program. You know, because of the intelligence coordination that we do with a range of countries, including Israel. Other mass murderers and they would get more criminals. Got we lots of friends in America willing to do war crimes, to too. Program. And that clock is See, he wants to stop the nuclear program. Not nuclear weapons, which they ain't got. And again, skillful liar tricking the American homies. And we're going to make sure that... I mean, how many times can he trick him with the same lie? Then again, they say if you repeat it often enough, and boy, has he repeated this one often enough, eh? No point has he ever said nuclear arms, that, well, maybe once early, to make the link. And after that, it was nuclear program, nuclear program, nuclear program, with everybody presuming he meant arms, and we know it's not true. And he's lying every time, but skillfully, to the credit. That was the thing about George Bush. He was a stupid liar. Couldn't tell a lie straight, you know. And then to go out there to admit he saw the first plane hit the building means that there was a videotape of that event sent directly to him to see it. Because there was no other videotape possible but a, but a live feed for President George Bush to watch. So he could then say, I saw the first plane hit. Bad pilot. So, George was really stupid liar and Barry's really good. Uh, if they do not meet uh, the demands of the international community, that's right. Then uh, we are going to take all options necessary to make sure that they don't have a nuclear weapon. Oh, ended with not a nuclear weapon. So, after all those shots at nuclear program, he finally ends up with it's going to be a stopping them from getting a nuclear weapon. And of course, yeah, if you stop a nation from developing civilian nuclear power. You've stopped them from developing a nuclear weapon, too. Now, why aren't they coming after Canada or India or some other countries, Japan, with civilian nuclear programs and getting after them? Oh, because they don't trust them. Double standard hypocrisy. Disgusting hypocrisy. I think uh, from the very beginning, one of the challenges we've had with Iran is that they have looked at this administration oh. and felt that the administration was not as strong as they needed to be. I think they saw weakness oh, where they had expected to find American strength. And I say that because from the very beginning, the president in his campaign some four years ago said he'd meet with all the world's worst actors in his first year. Uh, he'd sit down with Chavez and, and Kim Jong-il uh, with... Uh, and he doesn't think he should have been talking to anybody. You want to make war, you don't talk, right? A cash <laughs> See, all my enemies, he went and talked to them. He shouldn't have. Don't talk to enemies. How can you make war if you talk to your enemies? He won't make that mistake. I thought, well, that's an unusual uh, honor to receive from the President of the United States. And then the President began what I call the apology tour of going to the various nations of the uh, Middle East and, and criticizing America. And of course you could say that any kind of a peacemaking tour is an apology tour compared to a warmonger tour, right? I think they looked at that and saw weakness. Then when there were dissidents in the streets of Tehran, the Green Revolution, oh, Tehran all the time. saying, is America yes. with us? The president was silent. I think they noticed that as well. And I think that when the president said he was going to create daylight between ourselves and Israel. Oh, but now they're funding it. The uh, Iranian terrorists, Mech, right? They're not terrorists no more because there are terrorists. That, that they noticed that as well. All of these things suggested, I think, to the Iranian mullahs that, hey, you know, we can keep on pushing along here. We can keep talks going on, but we're just going to keep on spinning centrifuges. Now there are some 10,000 centrifuges. Wow, 10,000 centrifuges. That must mean they're developing a nuclear weapon. Or not. Now, does anybody think this low-tech lunatic has any idea what a centrifuge does?
Jeez. Spinning uranium. Spinning it. Just like wool. A nuclear threat to the United States and the world. Oh, my God. And, and it's essential for a president to show strength from the very beginning. That's right. And he's more delusional than Obama about the nuclear program. But he's still a pretty good liar, though. Hasn't really actually called it a weapon yet. To make it very clear what is acceptable and not acceptable. And an Iranian nuclear program is ah, not acceptable see, to us. See, see, they see. must not develop nuclear capabilities. See, and see, the way not to make sure we understand that is by having from the very beginning <laughs> pretty good the liars, too. sanctions possible. They need to be tough as sagging, tighten them, them hurt the people, to be suffer, we die. Need to yes. Down. We need to put the pressure on them as hard as. And I, we need to indict these guys, too. Incitement to genocide, for sure, on TV, for the record. <laughs> Boy, are you stupid. We possibly can, because if we do that, we won't have to take the military out. Well, let me just whisper. Think about it. War criminals on TV discussing what they want to do. Wow. While they're doing it, before they're doing it, approving what they're doing, ah, admitting past crimes. What Governor Romney just said is true. Starting with this notion of me apologizing. This has been... Uh, probably the biggest whopper that's been told during the course of this campaign. And every fact checker and every reporter has looked at it. Governor has said this is not true. And when it comes to tightening sanctions, look, as I said before, we put in the toughest, most crippling sanctions ever. And the fact is, while we were coordinating an international coalition to make sure these sanctions were effective, you were still invested in a Chinese state oil company that was doing business with the Iranian oil sector. So I think the American people decide, judge, who's going to be more effective and more credible when it comes to imposing crippling sanctions. And with respect to our attitude about the Iranian revolution, I was very clear. Who is going to be more effective at crippling people? And I think that maybe Obama would be a better crippler. Yeah, I think maybe he would. Though... Mitt really scares me, you know. I mean, about the murderous activities that have taken place. I know. I mean, what are we going to do about this man? And that was contrary to international law. I know. I mean, those invasions of Libya and the bombings and all the lies and the, you know, no fly zone being a bombardment. Real crimes he's admitting to here. That civilized uh, people stand for. I mean, yes, you discussed us, sir, what you did in Libya. And, and so the strength that we have shown in Iran is shown by the fact that we've been able to mobilize the world. When I came into office, the world was divided. Iran was resurgent. Iran is at its weakest point, economically, strategically, He's hurt militarily. Them. Yes, sir. Since, uh, that and the damage, yes. And we are going to continue to keep the pressure. Crippling damage. Make sure yes. that they do not get a nuclear weapon. That's in America's national interest. Ah. And that will be the case. Uh, he said nuclear weapon, he promises. By stopping the nuclear program, which doesn't have anything to do with the nuclear weapon, but the homies don't know. Oh, how stupid can the sheep will be? So long as I'm president. We're four years closer to a nuclear Iran. Ah, four years what is closer that? to nuclear Iran. And, and we should not have wasted these four years to the extent that... We should have pulled them up before. ...be able to spin these sanctions <laughs> and get that much closer. That's number one. That's number why you should have bombed them earlier. Call their apology yes, sir. It's because... You didn't you bomb them the soon Middle enough. East, and you flew to, to Egypt and to Saudi Arabia yeah. and to Turkey. And you should have bombed them. Bombed and them. Bombed them. Well, wait. You skipped Israel. <laughs> Our closest friend in the region. Oh, he skipped Don't Israel. Oh, and by the way... They noticed that you skipped Israel. <laughs> and then in those nations, on Arabic TV, you said that America had been dismissive and derisive. You said that on occasion, America had dictated to other nations. Well, under Bush, Mr. yeah. Biden, America has not dictated to other nations. All right. We have freed other nations from dictators. Uh, I know, by blowing up their infrastructure and killing a million at a time, they freed the Iraqis from their dictator. What, three million people dispossessed from their homes and a couple of million refugees and a million dead? He freed those people! Yes, sir! Let me, let me respond. Uh, you know, <laughs> we're going to talk about tricks. <laughs> you know, when I was a candidate for office, first trip I took was to visit our troops. And when I went to Israel as a candidate, I didn't take donors. I didn't attend fundraisers. 
I went to Yad Vashem, the, the Holocaust Museum there, to remind myself yeah. the, the nature hey, of people and why no our, our our is. With Israel will be unbreakable. That's right. And then I went down to the border towns of Sparrow, which oh. had experienced missiles raining down. How from wonderful can he be? Oh. And I saw families there. Ray loves Israel. Who showed me where missiles had come down near Get my money. children's bedrooms. And I was reminded of, of what that would mean if those were my kids. That's right. More Which money for donations person. to my campaign from American Jews. <laughs> I am going to program to stop We're on a good them. show at the, at the funeral so home. That's how I've used my travels. That's right. That's right. To Israel, Raise money. To Just Greece. like Mitt Romney did. And the, the <laughs> what I have at this man. point is going to be who's going to be credible to all parties involved, and they can look at my track record, whether it's Iran Cover with blog and he'll kill people, we know for sure. Whether it's supporting but I believe Mitt Romney is just as bloodthirsty. Women's rights, whether it's supporting religious minorities, rights. Rights. Women's women's rights. Rights. Oh, that's right. and they can say that While he's killing the people, he's supporting States women's and rights. the United States of America <laughs> is stood on the right side of history. And, and, and the that right kind side of, of history uh, is precisely we'll why we've been able to show leadership on a wide range of issues facing the world right now. Yes, sir. What if, what if the Prime Minister of Israel called you on the phone and said, Attack Iran! Our bombers are on the way. Oh, we're attacking we're Iran. Right <laughs> All right, we'll come to you. Um, it's, it, let's not go into hypotheticals of that nature. I, our relationship with Israel, my relationship with the Prime Minister of Israel is such that we yes, sir, yes, sir. get a call saying our bombers are on the way uh, or their fighters are on the way. They'll tell us in advance. The yeah, yeah. They didn't that tell that you about 911. Yeah. They were videotaping it in advance, yeah, but they didn't tell you, sucker. Well, that kind of. So that's the minute they adjust. I understand that. Okay. That's what. Uh, that's what. Uh, what, uh, what, uh, what uh, come on. We okay. know Mossad knew, right? Five Mossad guys videotaping 911 sent the feed to George Bush to see the first hit. Who else was videotaping the first hit so George Bush could have seen it? George Bush and the Mossad. Four years old. I see the Middle East with a rising tide. So who did 911? Yeah. George Bush and the Mossad. <laughs> I see uh, jihadists uh, continuing to spread, uh, whether they're rising or just about the same level. Hard to, hard to uh, uh, precisely measure, but this, it's clear they're there. They're very, very strong. I see Syria with 30,000 civilians. Oh. Uh, Assad's still in power. I bet that's I see not true. trade deficit with China. Uh, larger than it's uh, and even growing larger every year. Problems, I, yes. I, I look around the world. Something I, must I be done. The, 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 you see North Korea. So trust me to, to do the right their, thing. You know, their technology, Russia <laughs> said they're not going to follow non Luther anymore. Uh, they're uh, back away from, from the nuclear proliferation uh, treaty that we had with them. I, I look around the world. I don't see our influence growing around the world. I see our influence receding. In part <laughs> As if he would help. The president <laughs> view our economic which just balances it all. Whoa. In part because of our withdrawal from our commitment to our military, the way I think it ought to be. In part because of the the uh, um, uh, the turmoil with Israel. I mean, the president received a letter from 38 Democrat senators saying the tensions with Israel were a real problem. They asked him, please repair the tension. Democrat senators, please repair the damage right. in his own department. Do what you're told, boy! <laughs> Governor, the is, is that 38 senators telling you, do what Israel tells you. Whether it's the Middle East, whether it's Afghanistan, whether it's Iraq, whether it's now uh, Iraq, you've been all over the map. I mean, I'm, I'm pleased that you now are endorsing our policy of applying diplomatic pressure and potentially having uh, bilateral discussions with the Iranians to end their nuclear program. But just See, a few years ago, you program, said that's something you'd never do. He's not going to discuss armaments that because that ain't true. Proposed a timetable in Afghanistan. Ah, skillful liar. Now you're for it, although it depends. In the same way that you say you... Would have ended the war in Iraq, but recently gave a speech saying that we should have twenty thousand more folks in there. And now we just have the an underground CIA mercenary invasion. Mission creep to go after uh, Gaddafi. Oh, yeah. When it comes to you went after Gaddafi, Gaddafi Osama, murdered the saints. Away, we all know. God will but get you. When you were a candidate in two thousand eight, as I was, and I said if I got Bin Laden in our sights. I would I'd take kill. that shot. I would kill him. You said you killed lots of people without even putting them in his sights.
We have said we should ask Pakistan for permission. 2,000 dead people, 1,600 innocent. And it was worth moving. Kind of it was it. worth yeah. it. Yes, sir. So after we killed Bin Laden, 1,600 innocent Grand dead Zero people. For a memorial and talked to a, a, a young woman oh. who was four years old. He spoke to one young woman. 9-11 happened. And the last oh, I see. Not the 1,600 the dead Pakistanis. Okay. Him calling from the Twin Towers. Oh. Saying, Peyton, I love you and I will always She must feel so much better than those 1,600 and innocent Pakistanis that we drove day. Oh. day. She said to me, you know, More than the number of people who died on 911. Uh, that brought some closure. Oh, yes, yes. And now to kill 4,000, 4, 1,600 more people. Mm. But when we bring those Not quite more to half. justice, that sends a message to the world and it tells Peyton that. We did not forget her father, right. and, and I made that point because right. that's the kind of clarity we should right. and those. And I say the same thing that to the innocent people, families of the people slaughtered in Pakistan. Someday we'd like to see him in front of a court of law for the murders he did to. Him. So the words he's spouting about his theoretical murderers out there, we feel the same way towards him. Someday he's going to answer for what he did to your families, and I can't wait to stick around and watch his trial. As he explains, oh, it was worth it. I went and saw this one young victim of 911, and she made me feel so bad. I just felt killing 1,600 innocent people with drones was worth it. Decisions are not only popular. Those million people in the streets generally are not poll protesters. <laughs> oh, that was Bush. Some in my own party, including my current vice president, had the same critique as you did. But what the American people understand is, is that I look at what we need to get done to keep the American people safe and to move our interests forward. And that's and arm the rebels. Right. Let's go, and that leads us this Texas <laughs> right to the next segment, daughter. America's oh. longest war, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Oh, this should be fun. Uh, governor, you get to go you can't, first. You can't, okay, but you can't have the... the Retreat coming! Time to run, <laughs> just like <laughs> Vietnam! We'll give you... We'll, we'll agree. We'll catch up. The legitimate Taliban yeah, government's coming back. ...responsibility for security in Afghanistan to the Afghan government in 24... Oh, by the way, I got a picture of me when I was at the United Nations, and the 180 world leaders up there in my back wall, and one of them was from the Taliban, the official government who'd wiped out heroin production in Afghanistan, and uh, who weren't doing anything objectionable to anybody at all until we decided to invade them because we blamed Bin Laden for melting three steel buildings with two plane loads of gasoline, and invaded Afghanistan and blamed the Taliban for somehow having something to do with that harboring terrorism. And basically, we've invaded their country, and they're starting to kick our asses. And uh, people are finding out, just like in Vietnam, that those allies they've been training aren't really believers, okay, in the revolution against the, le the legitimate government. And they're now killing them when they get a chance. So, what can I say? You get what you deserve. The team at that point, we will withdraw our combat troops. Oh, yeah. Leave we'll mercenaries behind. Eh? And a couple of bases, maybe. <laughs> in Afghanistan for training purposes. Training it seems purposes. To me the key question here is standard cover, eh? What do you do if the deadline arrives and it is obvious? The Afghans are unable to handle their security. Well, of course they can't handle the legit legitimate Taliban government. Come on. Well, we're going to be finished by 2014. Oh, yeah. And when I'm president, we'll make sure we bring our troops out yeah, by the end of 2014. Oh, yeah? How? The commanders and the generals there oh, are make on sure. track to do so. We've the seen progress over the past several years. Seen progress. The surge has been <laughs> the successful. The surge worked. And uh, the training program is proceeding apace. There are oh. now uh, a, a large number of Afghan it's security not. forces, 350,000, that are, are, are ready not. to step in to provide security. No, they're not. And we're going to be able to make that transition <laughs> by the end of, of 2014. So our troops will come home at that point. Uh, I, I can't tell One you. What of that? 100 to 10. But, uh, that Doesn't happen. Uh, make sure that we, we look at what's happening in Pakistan. And recognize that what's happening it's in It's easy to make is money with these liars on TV. The success uh, in, in Afghanistan. And, and I say that because I know a lot of people just feel like we should just brush our hands and walk away. And I don't mean you, Mr. President, but some people in, the, in our nation um, feel that Pakistan is being nice to us and that we should just walk away from them. But Pakistan is important to the region, to the world, and to us. Because Pakistan has 100 nuclear warheads. 
and we need to control them. A lot more. They'll hang more than Great Britain sometime in the, in the relatively near future. Uh, they also have the uh, Akkadi network and, and the Taliban uh, existence in our country. And so a, a, a Pakistan that falls apart becomes a failed state would be of extraordinary danger to Afghanistan. And keep our dictators in control. And so we're going to have to remain helpful in, in helpful Pakistan and encouraging. A, a more stable government and, and rebuild to move towards a more stable that government of our choice. The aid that we provide to Pakistan is going to have to be conditioned uh, upon certain benchmarks being met. That's right. They better so for me, keep I us happy. Both a, a need to help <laughs> move Pakistan in the right direction and also to get Afghanistan to to be ready, and they will be ready by the end of 2004. Mr. Crest. I bet not. Yep. When I came into office, we were still bogged down in Iraq. And Afghanistan had been drifting for a decade. We ended the war in Iraq. No, you didn't. Mercenaries on. still there, lots, bases, lots. We did deliver a surge of troops. That was facilitated in part because we had ended the war in Iraq. And we are now in a position where we have met many of the objectives that got us there in the first place. So you can retreat now. <laughs> we went because there were people who were responsible for. 3,000 American deaths. Oh, bull, not true. Taliban had nothing to do with it. In the border regions between uh, Afghanistan. Bush and the Mossad took those buildings down. And then started to build up Afghan forces. And we're now in a position where we can transition out. Because there's no reason why Americans should die when Afghans are perfectly capable of defending their own country. Now that transition <laughs> has to take place in a responsible fashion. We've been there a long time, and we've got to make sure that we and our coalition partners are pulling out. With Just like Vietnam, the exact same story. And that's why they didn't pull out year after year after year. Anyway, what can I say? Deja vu. Responsibly and giving Afghans the capabilities that they need. Giving the South Vietnamese the capabilities they need. The American people recognize this after a decade of war. After a decade of war. building here at all. And what Time to do some nation building at home. We've done so much nation building overseas with our bombs. <laughs> Mr. Nation Builder. <laughs> what we can now do is free up some resources to, for example, put Americans back to work, especially oh. our veterans. Oh. We're building our roads, our bridges, oh. our schools. Wow, if only we had money, sure that, free money, uh, yeah. You know, our veterans are Tell us all the, the good things you could do if you had some money, sir. Through. Post traumatic stress. Oh, disorder. yes, we could do that. Yeah. We could do this. Brain if we had more money, sure yes. The certifications that they. We could ensure, uh, yes. Jobs of the future. Yeah, just more money and it would solve everything, right? Lunch with some, uh, a veteran in Minnesota. If we were saving all this wasted and money, he yes. Now, dealing with the most extreme circumstances, when he came home and he wanted to become a nurse, Things he had to start from scratch. Oh. And what we've said is, let's change those certifications. Uh, the First Lady has done great work with an organization called Joint Enforcement. Bureaucratic Putting change, in here. effect. And, and as a consequence, <laughs> veterans unemployment is actually now lower than the general population. It was higher when I came into office. So those are the kinds of things that we can now That's do right. because we're making that transition in Afghanistan. Yeah. All right, let me go to... Uh, the transition uh, in Afghanistan uh, are making, uh, yes. Because you talked about it. Unsuccessfully. And what needs to be done there. General Allen our commander in Afghanistan says that Americans continue to die at the hands of groups who are supported by Pakistan. We know that Pakistan has arrested the doctor who helped us catch Obama's uh, bin Laden. Uh, it still provides safe haven for terrorists. Yet Bomb Pakistan. Pakistan. Oh, we are. Billions of dollars. Is it time for us to divorce Pakistan? No. It's not time to divorce uh, a, a nation. You mean divorce and bomb, man. Yeah. Nuclear weapons, and it's on the way to, to double that at some point. Uh, a nation that has uh, a serious uh, threats from uh, uh, terror groups, terrorist groups within its nation. Uh, as I indicated before, the Taliban, the Haqqani Network. Uh, it's a nation that's not like, uh, like others, and it does not have a civilian leadership that is calling the shots there. You've got the ISI, their intelligence organization is probably the most powerful of the um, of three. So like the CIA in America. <laughs> uh, this is a, a nation which, if it falls apart, if it, if it becomes a failed state, uh, there are nuclear weapons there. 
and you've got you've got terrorists there who can grab their their hands out of those nuclear weapons. This is this is an important. We must control uh, that government. Force. Uh, Pakistan For is, is peace. technically an ally. And, and they're not acting very much like an ally right for now. Our so we have some work to do. And I, I don't blame the administration for the fact that the relationship with, with Pakistan is strained. Uh, we, we had to go into Pakistan. We had to go in there to get Osama bin Laden. That was the right thing to do. Uh, and, and that upset them. But there was we can go anywhere we want. Even before it was that. the right thing to do. We're going to have to work with the, with the, uh, the people in Pakistan to try and help them move to a more responsible... We're going to have to move the people it's a more responsible it's course. It's important for nuclear weapons. It's important for the success of Afghanistan. Because inside... Sending some armaments to their rebels. What's in Syria and Libya? The Taliban. They're going to come rushing back in. Afghanistan. That's right, they will. That's one of the reasons the Afghan security forces have so... No, they won't the actually. The Taliban weren't all well, So it's of. important for us to recognize that we can't just walk away from Pakistan. But we do need to make sure... Now, you know Al-Qaeda were originally CIA, right? They were the CIA database attacking the Russians who were attacking Afghanistan. And that's why I find it hard to believe... Sure, when I saw that pair of boots floating in the ocean, that was pretty convincing evidence that they had killed, uh, you know, Bin Laden. But I still have a funny feeling CIA don't do that to their most successful agents, and he's probably living in retirement in Miami Beach, okay? As we, as we send support for them, that, that this is tied to them making progress on on matters that would lead them to becoming a civil society. Oh, uh, they're not yeah, civil enough right because now. Because we know uh, President Obama's position on this. What is his, What is your position on the use wow. of drones? Oh, we kill anybody. Well, I believe that we should use any and all means. Any and all means. Out, take out anybody we want. Pose a threat to us. Pose a threat. Around the world. Yes. And uh, it's right. That's what kill you. Drones are being used in drone strikes, and I support that entirely. He does. He and does. I feel the president was he right. He does. And I hope someday he goes to jail for it. Yes. I believe that we should continue to use it to continue uh, to go after. I believe you should be jailed someday for what you're talking about, yes, friend. sir. Uh, let me also know you're that a war criminal, a mass murderer, and deserve to be going punished. after leaders and, and killing bad guys. Oh well, yeah, what about the innocent people? Right? The 1,600 innocent, innocent victims. Collateral damage. Oh, I'm so sorry. It did good for our side. From terror and Islamic extremism. Oh, extremism. We, have we talk a lot about these things, but you look at the the record. You look at the record. Yeah, what's the score? When was the last terrorist incident in the United States caused by someone from another country? And I'm not counting 911. <laughs> or it wasn't that other country. So, yeah, not too many terrorist incidents, right? As a matter of fact, I would bet that when you consider the million the Iraqis killed and the th tens of thousands of Afghanis and... Jeez, you know, they might already have a hundred to one on them. Yeah, you killed a hundred to one in return. The last four years and say, is Iran closer to a bomb? Yes. Ah. Uh, the Middle East. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, talking to someone. Yes. Is uh, is Al Qaeda on the run, uh, on its heels? No. Uh, it is uh, are Israel and the Palestinians closer to, to reaching a peace agreement? No, they haven't had been talks in two years. We have not seen the. I know it's just like the Nazis and the inmates in their concentration camp just couldn't handle negotiations doesn't seem to work with the Jews and the Palestinians in their concentration camps. But I'll tell you one thing, the Jews learned about concentration camps and how to do it right, didn't they? Yes, sir. Never again to us as we do it to someone else. <laughs> what a, just like America. I think America is the only country I can think of with a more disgusting history than Israel. Progress we need to have. And I'm convinced that with strong leadership... America's history? Disgusting? Just go see what they did to the native populations. ...and an effort to build a... Go see what they did to the Palestinians. <laughs> ...strategy based upon helping these nations reject extremism. We can oh. see the kind of peace and prosperity the world demands. Anyway, what can I say? The double speak is just... Well, keep in mind, our strategy wasn't just going after Bin Laden. And we oh, no, we killed lots of innocent people, too. ...with extremists in Somalia, in Yemen, in Pakistan. Yeah. And what we've also done 
is engage these governments. Three other and countries has killed people. They're actually going to make a difference in people's lives day to day. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's convincing these dictatorships sure to go better on their people. Corrupt, to make sure that they are treating women with make the kind sure, of yeah. respect and dignity that every nation that succeeds has shown. In a bombed out and shelter, right? Sure that, <laughs> that works. So across oh. the board, we are engaging them in building capacity in these countries, and we've stood on the After we've destroyed it. Now, one thing I think... Democracy at the point of a gun. When Tunisians began to protest, this nation, me, rose up. my administration, stood with them earlier than just about any other country. That's right, we were against their government, so we stood with them. Stood if they were against one of our allies, Tunisia. we wouldn't. We stood on the side of the people. And as a consequence... Didn't stand on the side of the Egyptian people, did they? About Americans have changed. But there are always going to be elements in these countries that <sighs> potentially threaten the United States. Oh yeah, we've got to kill them first. Those groups and those networks, and we can do that. That's right, you can go after those networks. But we're always we're also going to have to maintain vigilance when it comes to terrorist activities. The truth, though, is that Al-Qaeda... Al Qaeda. Weaker than it was when I came into office, and they don't have the same capacities to attack the U.S. homeland. They never did. And our allies, as they did four years ago. Let's uh, let's go to the next segment because it's four a very years important ago. one. It is uh, the rise of China and future challenges for America. I want to just begin this by asking uh, both of you and uh, Mr. President, you you go first this time. Now remember, America couldn't have made all these wars if China hadn't financed their deficit, okay? And America's going to have to make war on China to be able to stiff their creditor. And go back in history, and throughout all of history, when a debtor couldn't pay, he ended up having to fight with his creditor to stiff him, because the creditor had to come and collect. So it always turned into a fight. So, America's going to try and pick a fight with China so they can stuff them on the debt. What do you believe is the greatest future threat to the national security of this country? Well, I think it will continue Iran. to be uh, terrorist networks. Oh, terrorist we have networks. To remain vigilant, as yeah, I just said. Had none of them in the last couple of years, but... China's both an advocate... Eight, they set up a lot of FBI frame-ups and talk some stupid donkeys into picking up some fake explosives and trying to blow something up and then charging them as terrorists. Imagine, homegrown terrorists trained and organized by the FBI to take the rap. Wow, talk about scaring the homies. Sir, but also a potential partner in the international community if it's following the rules. So my attitude coming into office was that we are going to insist that China plays by the same rules as everybody else. Now, does anybody have an idea what rules he says China is breaking? Think about it. No, we don't know, do we? But China bad. Okay, keep going. I know Americans have, have seen jobs being shipped overseas. Oh, they got shipped, they carried out in boxes. Not getting a level playing field when it came to trade. And that's the reason why I set up a trade task force. Hey, you know, in the old days when America benefited benefited from the uneven, uneven terrain of trade, you know, they didn't complain too much about it then, did they? Ah, nice to see America's getting beat up in the economic forum. Uh, go after cheaters when it came to international trade. Oh, that's that the reason mean? why we have brought more cases against China for violating trade rules than the other uh, the previous administration had done in two terms. Yeah. And we won... Instead of one, we did two. No, I don't know. Tell us, tell us. Just about every case? Both! Maybe three. That we filed. <laughs> How many cases did you file, sir, against China? That has been decided. Ah, fact, that has been decided after 18 years in the courts. <laughs> recently, recently. workers in Ohio. What? And uh, throughout the Midwest, Pennsylvania, are in a position now to sell steel to China because we won that case. One. We had a tire case. Two with tires. Flooding us oh. with cheap domestic tires or, or, or cheap uh, Chinese tires. Now, why would we object to somebody selling us their product for below the cost of making it? I mean, they would be pretty stupid, wouldn't they, to be selling us product at below the cost of making it? And why would be we be stupid enough? 
to want to stop them. So, he wants to stop China from selling us super cheap goods where they take a loss. And I guess we take a win. But he doesn't like that. Now, why do you think they want to stop China from taking a loss on their sale of products to us? Can you figure it out? I know the answer, but I bet you don't. And we put a stop to it. And as a consequence, save jobs throughout America. Save jobs. I have to say yes, that yes. Governor Romney criticized me for being too tough. How many? 14! Yes! 14 jobs in the tire industry. And how many jobs in the other industry? All right. In that tire case. Said this wouldn't be good for American workers and that it would be protectionist. All right, a couple of hundred. But I jobs. tell you, those workers don't feel that way. That's right. They all feel all as 200 if of them. They yeah. had finally an administration who was going to take this issue seriously. Yes. Over the long term, two cases in instead order of one. for us to compete with China. We've also got to make sure, though, that we're make sure. taking, this, taking care of business here at home. Yeah, make if sure. We don't have the best education system in the world. Oh, we need the best. We don't continue to put money into research. Kind of research. And technology. Yes, yes, yes. Where do you get the money? To, to create great here <laughs> oh, but if you had it, it would allow us to do all these things he's going to say. Unfortunately, yeah. Governor Romney's yeah. budget, uh, and if his he had the money, would not allow us to make those investments. Oh. Governor, well, first of all, Romney doesn't have money either. That makes business successful. It's not government investments that make businesses grow and hire people. Uh, let me also note that the greatest threat that the world faces, the greatest national security threat, is a nuclear Iran. Oh. Uh, let's talk about China. Oh. Uh, China has an interest that's very... A country that has never attacked anyone else in history is being worried about by a mad dog, rabid country that's attacked everybody else in history. <laughs> what a joke. How ironic, eh? Much like ours, in one respect, and that is they want a stable world. They don't want war. They don't want to see uh, protectionism. They don't want to see uh, the, the world uh, break out into, into various forms of chaos because they have to they have to manufacture goods and put people to work. They have about 20,000, 20 million rather, people coming out of the farms every year, coming into the cities, needing jobs. So they want the economy to work and the world well, to be free. That's what they want, people. yes. Oh. And so we can be a partner with China. In wanting. We don't have to be an adversary in any way, shape, or form. We can work with them. We can collaborate with them yeah. if they're willing to be responsible. Now, they look at us and say, is it a good idea to be with America? How strong are we going to be? How strong ah, is our economy? Can they kill people? Yes. We own a trillion dollars. I saw they can kill lots of people. people. Trillion total, <laughs> they, they look at our, our decision to, to cut back on our military capabilities. A trillion dollars. Ah, the they cannot kill so many people. A trillion dollars to cut our military. <laughs> devastating. It's not my term. It's the President's own Secretary of Defense called them devastating. They look at, at, at America's uh, commitments around the world and they see what's happening and they say, well, okay, is America going to be strong? And the answer is yes. If I'm president, America will be very strong. Oh, we'll also make well, sure smell that we everything. have trade relations with China that work for us. I've watched year in oh, and year out well, as companies as people have families, relations that work for us. Jobs because China has not played by the same rules, in part by holding down artificially the value of their currency. It holds down the prices of their goods. It means our goods aren't as competitive, and we lose jobs. That's got to end. They're making some progress. They need to make more. That's why on day one, I will label them a currency manipulator, oh. which allows us to apply tariffs where they're taking jobs. And they'll do it right back. Our intellectual property, our patents, our it's called design, tariff wars. Hacking into what our an computers. idiot think he can start yeah, laying tariff without getting hit back. They have to understand. We want to trade with you got to understand, they're bigger spirit. than you. We like free enterprise. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure you do. Uh, well, Governor, let me just ask you. Uh, <laughs> if you declare them a currency manipulator on day one, some people are saying uh, you're just going to start a trade war That's right. with China on day one. Yes. Is that, isn't there a risk that that could happen? Well, they sell it us about hurt. this much stuff every year. And we sell them about this much stuff every year. So it's pretty clear who doesn't want a trade war. And there's one going on right now, which we don't know about. It's a silent one. And, and they're winning. We have enormous... So think about it. They're losing this much every year, and we're losing exporting this much every year, and who's happier? <laughs> the guy's losing this much every year, and we don't want him losing so much, is what he's saying. <laughs> and we want to lose more. 
trade imbalance in China. And it's worse this year than last year. And it's worse last year than the year before. And, and so we have to understand that we can't just surrender and, and lose jobs year in and year out. We have to say to our... I lost some jobs, Lord. Yesterday on the bus, I lost three of them. Understand this can't keep on going. You can't keep on holding down the value of your currency, stealing our intellectual property, counterfeiting our products, selling them around the world, even in the United States. I was with one company that makes uh, uh, valves uh, in, in process industries. And they said, look, we were, we were having some valves coming in. He's blaming the Chinese government for this? For crooked businesses? Ah, just like they blame the nuclear program instead of nuclear arms. That were broken, and we had to repair them under warranty. And we looked them up, and, and they had our serial number on them. And then we noticed that, that there was more than one with that same serial number. There were counterfeit products being made overseas with the same serial number as a wow. U.S. company, the same packaging. These were being sold into our market and around the world. By the Chinese the government. By the U.S. competitor. This can't go on. Oh, I want a great relationship. A U.S. competitor China. in China, not China the Chinese government. government. He'll fight with but, the Chinese government. that doesn't government. mean they can just roll all over us and steal our jobs on an unfair basis. Steal our well, jobs. Well, is right. Uh, you are familiar stole with... Stolen them. Stolen them. Because you invested in companies that were shipping jobs overseas. And, you know, that's, you're right, I mean, that's, and, you know, that's, you're right, I mean, that's how our free market works. But I've made a different bet on American workers. You know, if we had taken your advice, Governor Romney, about our auto industry, we'd be buying cars from China instead of selling cars to China. If we take your advice with respect to how we change our tax codes so that companies that earn profits overseas don't pay U.S. taxes compared to companies here that are paying taxes. Now, that's estimated to create 800,000 jobs. The problem is they won't be here. They'll be in places like China. And if we're not making investments in education and basic research, which is not something that the private sector is doing at a sufficient pace right now and has never done, then we will lose the lead in things like clean energy technology. Now, with respect to what we've done with China already, U.S. exports have doubled since I came into office to China. And actually, currencies are at their most advantageous point for U.S. exporters since 1993. We absolutely have to make more progress, and that's why we're going to keep on pressing. And when it comes to our military and Chinese security, part of the reason that we were able to uh, pivot to the Asia-Pacific region after having ended the war in Iraq, and transitioning out of Afghanistan yes. is precisely because this is going to be a massive growth area. So he's moved the armaments from where they've already finished the military job out against China now. And that's going to help make peace and prosperity. <laughs> a better future. And a better future. Be a but we're also... yeah. China's going to be our partner as we ring them with armaments. <laughs> it's a very clear signal that America is a Pacific power, that we are going to have a presence there. We'll be there with our guns. We are working with countries in the region to make sure, for example, that ships can pass through, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that commerce continues. Yeah. No fly and zone. Boom, boom. Relations <laughs> with countries other than China so that China starts feeling more pressure ah, on yes. basic international standards. And then we'll start That's funding the, the armaments to the rebels. The That's the kind of leadership that we'll continue to show. Same kind of leadership they've like shown elsewhere. Um, uh, again, uh, attacking me is not talking about an agenda for, for for getting more trade and opening up more jobs in this country. But, but the president mentioned the auto industry and that somehow I would be in favor of jobs being elsewhere. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, I, I'm a son of Detroit. I was born in, in Detroit. Uh, my dad was head of a car company. Uh, I like American cars. And uh, I would so do nothing with the U.S. Yeah. auto industry. My plan to get the industry on its feet when it was in real trouble was not to start writing checks. It was President Bush that wrote the first checks. I disagree with that. I said they need these companies need to go through a managed bankruptcy, and in that process they can get government help and government guarantees, but they need to go through bankruptcy to get rid of excess cost and the debt burden that they they built up. And fortunately, a debt write-off specialist. Was it spontaneous? Was it an intelligence failure? Was it a policy failure? Uh, was oh, it no. Stop. Uh, excuse me.
All right, where was I? 120. Oh, shit, isn't that sad? What was I at? Let's get out here. Oh, jeez. A trillion dollars. I know other people, 16 trillion in total, including that. Oh, they, they look at our, our decision to, to cut back on our military capability. Taking, bus taking care of business here at home. If we don't have the best education system in the world, if we don't continue to put money into research and technology <laughs> that will allow us to, to create great businesses here in the United States, that's how if we only. lose the competition. And unfortunately, Governor Romney's budget this already. Uh, and his proposals would not allow us to make those investments. All right. Governor. Well, first of all, it's not government that makes business successful. It's not government investments that make businesses grow and hire people. Uh, let me also note that the greatest threat that the world faces, the greatest national security threat, is a nuclear Iran. Um, let's talk about China. Uh, China has an interest that's very much like ours, in one respect, and that is they want a stable world. They don't want war. They don't want to see uh, protectionism. They don't want to see uh, the, the world uh, break out into, into various forms of chaos because they have to they have to manufacture goods and put people to work. They have about 20,000, 20 million kind of people coming out of the farms every year, coming into the cities, needing jobs. So they want the economy to work and the world to be free and open. And so we can be a partner with China. We don't have to be an adversary in any way, shape, or form. We can work with them. We can collaborate with them if they're willing to be responsible. Now, they look at us. Like every other debtor creditor, and they look at you like a debtor. <laughs> and say, is it a good idea to be with America? How strong are we going to be? You're going to go broke. Oh, oh guns. guns. Lots of guns. The fact that we own a no money, lots of, of guns. People, 16 trillion in total, including them. They, they look at our, our decision to, to cut back on our military capabilities. A trillion dollars. The Secretary of Defense called these trillion dollars of cuts to our military devastating. It's not my term. It's the president's own secretary of defense called them devastating. That's right. They the guy who wants the bigger budget. America's uh, commitments around the world, and they see what's happening, and they say, "Well, okay, is America going to be?" I mean, I already spend more than everybody else in the world combined, but it ain't enough not to be devastating. Strong, and the answer is yes. If I'm president, America will be very strong. We'll also make oh, sure that God. we. Oh God! If he's president, America's going to spend a lot of money on weaponry and not on poor people, for sure. Yeah, there can check the record. All right. Governor Romney, you keep on trying to you know, airbrush history. You were very clear that you would not provide government assistance to the U.S. auto companies even if they went through bankruptcy. You said that they could get it in the private marketplace. That wasn't true. They would have gone through a little... Iran. I, uh, no, I am not Iran. I, I am not People wrong. can look it up. You're right. People will look it up. Good. But more importantly, it is true you're that on, you're on, you're right, you're right. to be competitive, we're going to have to make some smart choices right now. Ooh. Cutting our education budget, that's not a smart choice. That will no, not help us compete no, with China. No. If only we had Cutting money, right? In research and technology, Dad. that's not a smart choice. Uh -huh. That will not help us compete with China. Bringing down our deficit on by won't help. seven trillion dollars of help. tax cuts and military spending that our military is not asking for before we even get to yeah. the debt that we currently have. Yeah. That is not going to make us more competitive. Won't work. Those are Expert the on what choices won't work. That American people face right now. Having a tax code that rewards companies that are shipping jobs overseas won't work. Companies that are investing here in the United States that will not make us more competitive. And, and the one thing that I'm absolutely clear about Don't is work. that after a decade in which we saw drift, jobs being shipped overseas, nobody championing American workers and American businesses, we've now begun to make some real progress. What we can't do is go begun back to make. the same policies some. that got us into such difficulty in the first place. And that's why we have to move forward and not go back. Move forward, yes. I could agree, agree more about going forward, but I certainly don't want to go back to the policies of the last four oh, years. I want to go forward. Yes. The policies of the last four years have seen incomes in America Bad policies for middle-income families. Now down $4,300 during the term. 23 million Americans still struggling to find a good job. Things are bad. When you came to office, 32 million people on food stamps. Today, Things are bad. 7 million people on food Things stamps. Things are worse. When you came to office, just over $10 trillion in debt. Things were bad. Now, $16 trillion. Things were worse.
You said by now we'd be at 5.4 percent unemployment. We're nine million Things were bad. short of that. Things are worse. I've met some of those people. I've met them in Appleton, Wisconsin. And he I've knows. I've met a young woman in, 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 in Philadelphia who's coming out of, out of college, can't find work. I've met <laughs> and was with someone just the other day that was just weeping about not being able to get work. It, it, it's just a tragedy in a nation yeah. so prosperous as ours. I know, but him with all his money he felt so, so bad. And, that, and that's why it's so critical that we make America once again the most attractive place in the world to make start it again. businesses, to, to build jobs, to grow build the jobs. economy. And that's not going to happen right. by, by just... Okay, that's the first time I ever heard jobs being built. You know, I like to say finance with paychecks. Obama just likes to say created, but he's the first guy ever wants to build jobs. I mean, teachers, look, I, I love to, I love teachers, and I'm happy to have Ooh. states and communities that he want loves to, education. to do that. I, by the way, I, I don't like to have the federal government start pushing this way deeper and deeper into, into our schools. Let the states and localities do that. I was a governor. The federal government didn't hire our teachers. But, but I, I love teachers. But I want to get our private sector teachers. growing, and I know how to do it. I think we all love teachers. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for, for a very vigorous debate. We have come to the end. We all love teachers. Closing statement. I believe you're first, Mr. And both of them will cut funding to teachers. I believe you're first. Mr. Last so chance. Thank you very much, Bob Pedroni, and to Lynn University. Now, you've now heard three debates, months of campaigning, and way too many TV commercials. <laughs> and now you've got a choice. Now, over the last four years, we've made real progress digging our way out of policies that give <laughs> us... Real progress. Do you want more? Isn't that, funny? Isn't that funny? Right after Romney pointed out how everything was bad when he started, and everything is now worse, he's now saying, yeah, everything was really bad when I started, but things are now a little bit better. Wow. Too bad he didn't have the numbers proving things were better, like Romney had the numbers proving things were worse. Back to those policies. Uh, foreign policy that's wrong and reckless. Uh, economic policies that won't. These are the same policy as his. Won't create jobs. Won't reduce our deficit. But we'll make sure that folks at the very top don't have to play by the same rules that you do. And I've got a different vision for our. Ah, try and get the lower classes angry at the richer classes and not the machine. Perfect. I want to build on our strengths. What's a build? And I put forward a plan. To make sure that we're bringing manufacturing jobs back to our shores. Oh, yeah. A plan. He's had it for four years and he's only putting it now. By rewarding companies and small businesses that are investing here, not overseas. And why didn't you do that four years ago, sir? I want to make sure we've got the best education system in the world. Ah, uh, because last time he only wanted to make sure. He didn't promise it. Like he only wants to make sure again now without actually promising it. We're retaining our workers. Oh, yes. Get the jobs that's smart. Make sure. I want to control our own energy. That's what he wants. By developing oil and natural gas. But yes, that's the energy sources of the future. That's what he wants. Yes, I want to reduce our yes. deficit by cutting spending that we don't need, but also by asking the wealthy to do a little bit more. That's what he wants. So that we can invest in things like research and technology. Oh, and that would solve everything. To a 21st century economy. The key. As Commander-in-Chief, <laughs> I will maintain the strongest military in the world. Oh, that's for sure we believe, okay? And go after those who would do us harm. Before they think of it. And then you'll talk them into doing it even if they weren't thinking of it. Like the FBI stings against the dummies, okay? Terrorists! Homegrown! <laughs> but after a decade of war, I think we all recognize we've got to do some nation building here at home. We don't have I know, they've done such successful nation-building overseas, you deserve a little bit of your own back home. Actually, if you look at the inner-city ghettos, they pretty well destroyed that nation-building, too. Our roads, our bridges, and especially... Oh, yes, veterans, things need to be fixed. So much oh, free. yes, they need. You know, we've been through tough times, Us. but we always bounce back because of our character. Because we pull together. Ra, ra, ra. I have the privilege of being your president for another four years. I promise you, I will always listen to your voices. Oh, I will fight yes. for your families. Yes, I will fight. And I will work every single day to make sure that America continues to make be sure. the greatest nation on earth. Thank you. He will make sure it's the greatest Thank on you, earth. Bob, Mr. President, folks at Lynn University. <laughs> what standard rhetoric? Who wrote that speech?
He'll make sure that we're the greatest nation on earth. Jesus, you're already lagging on all human rights and, <laughs> and you statistics. To be with you, um, I'm optimistic about this. You think you'd have ever caught up with Libya? Okay, everybody free health care, free education, everybody had a house, everybody had a job, interest-free loans. You think you'd have ever caught up with Libya? No, 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 you killed Muammar because he showed you up for the bum you were. Future, I'm excited about our prospects as a nation. I want to see peace. I want to see peace. <laughs> the man who's talking about already at war because they have the capacity is talking about peace. Remember? I, peace anyway. in this country, it's our objective. We have an opportunity to have real leadership. America's going to have that... Oh, actually, this is pretty well the only scripted part other than the talking points. This two-minute closing, okay? Written by his agents. And a leadership and continue to yes. promote principles uh, of peace. Yes, we'll principles of peace. Safer place. With all armaments to the rebels. Yes, promote principles of peace by financing revolutions against legitimate governments. Yes, sir. The principles of peace. And make people in this country more confident mm -hmm. that their future is secure. Jesus. I also want to make sure that we get... Pretty sad, eh, when you think of the two lunatics running, that, uh, what kind of a choice the poor Americans have. Jeez. Too bad they didn't find out about the candidate offering them interest-free treasury loans. This economy going. Oh, yes. Two very different paths the country can take. Yes. Like One is this. a path represented like by the president, which, at the end of four years, would mean we'd have $20 trillion in debt. work, yes. Heading towards Greece. I'll get us on track to a balanced budget. Oh, you will, eh? The president's path Magics. will mean continuing declining in take-home pay. He has a five-policy sure plan. The take pay turns around and starts to grow. The president's path means 20 million people out of work struggling for a good job. It means that we are back to work with 12 million new jobs. Wow, what a I promise! Sure get people off of food stamps, not my country. Obama's facing the loss of 20 million, but he's going to turn it around, come back with plus 12, 32 million dollar swing because of his policies after he spent the 8 billion dollars on war and all the other things he wants to blow it on. Wow. He's got lots of money. If I get them good jobs, America's going to come back, and for that to happen, we're going to have to have a president who can work across the aisle. I was in a oh. state where my legislature was 87% Democrat. That's why he had to and do what they said. <laughs> we the the aisle. We've got to do that in Washington. Washington is broken. I know what it takes to get this country back. And oh, we'll work God. With good Democrats and good Republicans to do that. How can a guy who doesn't know what it takes look him right in the eye and say he does? Well, it's Obama did too. Except he's the proven failure. This guy's the maybe failure. But you're sitting there saying, geez, I got a choice between continued proven failure or this guy who looks like a catastrophe coming up. <laughs> what a choice. Got to pick between the Gilligan or Mr. Howell. <laughs> this nation is the hope of the earth. Rich boy. We've been blessed by having a nation that's well, you've been blessed and prosperous thanks to the contributions of the greatest generation. <laughs> that's right. Thanks to the contributions of the poor, he and his family have been blessed. Now a torch. Big bank account. The torch of freedom. Other people's money. Interest. Now it's our turn to take that torch. I'm convinced we'll do it. Yeah. We need strong leadership. I can just see him approaching other countries with a torch, you know? What would you think? Uh-oh, here's, here's Mick coming with a torch. <laughs> it's the torch of peace. No oh, shit. I thought it was another, you know, cannon. I'd like to be that leader with your support. I'll work with you. I'll lead you in an open and honest way. And I ask for your vote. Oh. I'd like to be the next president of the United States oh, to support God. and help this great nation oh, and to God. make sure that we all together maintain America as the hope of the earth. Thank you so much. Oh, God. Uh, maintain the biggest warmonger, rabid, mad dog nation of the earth, you know, as the hope of the earth. Double speak. Oh. Let's face it. No one's made more war more times in this last century than America. No one's killed more other foreigners in this century than America. Our true hope for peace. <laughs> well, thank you both so much. That brings an end to this year's debate. Uh, we want to thank Lynn University and its students for having us. As I always do at the end of these debates, I leave you with the words of my mom. You know, considering you didn't ask any hard questions, I ain't too interested in the words of your mom. They're probably just as dull as your ideas were. Said, go vote.
<laughs> and if you don't know what's happening, don't go vote. These guys who say, go out there and vote even if you don't know anything, are betting you're going to pick one of the stupid guys. If you don't know what's happening, don't vote. Let the smart people vote. Okay? When they say, go vote. Yeah, yeah, we want the dumbest people all voting, right? Make sure feel stay strong. Ah, yes. Thank you. Go out there and vote for one of the two losers. Anyway, if you don't know what's going on, don't vote. Or vote for an independent, or go do some homework. Okay, so those are the three debates for the American presidency. With one candidate I call the Gillian, the proven failure, the complete ineptitude all the time. And then the other candidate, the rich, you know, silver spooner, Mr. Howell from the famous Gilligan's Island series, and I like to play the part of the professor explaining how these dummies are making mistakes. So, why would I take the time to do this? You know, 30, 40 people in this slave generation are going to watch this in not comprehending what I'm talking about. But I have the hope that the future generation who are, won't be debt slaves anymore and won't be deluded by money, the mammon, the false god, will have a greater appreciation for the jokes and the yucks we've had here today. You know, we've watched mass murderers on TV admitting their crimes up front, how they plan them, they encourage them, they want to make people in pain and make them die and make them suffer and they're organizing people to help. And it just an unbelievably disgusting world that these kind of men want to lead, if you think about it right. And uh, it's kind of sad that this generation is so befuddled by mammon that they chase the fall god and can't see the lies inherent in what they're saying. So, it's a chance for me to make fun of them and of this generation's debt slaves who just don't realize that right around the corner with a soft square switch of the money at a chair so everybody can survive the musical chairs game and their brains change. Watch what happens. No more elbows. No more need to be greedy. Everyone's got some. But until we're, as long as we're playing Death Gamble and they're in that game, Jesus said they'll forever be hearing without hearing and seeing without seeing or understanding. So if you play musical chairs all your life, and uh, you don't think there's any other way, well then of course you're going to believe people are ugly and greedy and elbowy and nasty and will take you when they can. But if you played the game with enough chairs for everybody, pretty soon you'd find out that, geez, nobody's elbowing anymore. So, the world's about to change when we get rid of the interest, and there are other videos I've done to explain the growth of the interest-free community currency movement around the world based on human time as collateral, not on stuff or yellow or silver rock. And so this is an opportunity to see the last of the old world's political debates before what I hope, before the mind prophecy in two months, happens, and the unions of the planet demanding pay and interest-free government currencies, and the workers of large corporations demand to be paid in their corporate currencies, like in Russia, because even people like John Termel can issue my own personal IOU online, says I owe those people in France for four nights in Paris. And who can stop me from running my own IOUs, and who can stop any database, any nation, and our whole world. So, as you hear, the time banks in Spain are exploding 300 this year. All these little let systems will unite soon someday into a global unilets, a United Nations international and local employment trading system where we can trade our work not only locally but internationally too, like I did by trading for accommodations with Europe on my trip a while back. So, here we are looking at the end I hope soon, of the old world's generations, politicos, the men who get on TV and talk about slaughtering innocents like it was some calculation, and as long as there's some good in it for us, that makes it all okay. And, uh, and I predict that in heaven, most of the fun's going to be attending the trials. Don't forget, no punishments, right? Their souls can't hurt them, except for shame, as they get to sit through there and know that everybody's watching what they did. So... 
Like I said, I'm proud of my life, my career. I'll face my maker any time. But boy, would I not want to be these guys when it comes to face their maker with all the blood on their hands. I'm Johnny Engineer Termel, still running for Prime Minister of the Planet before Christmas. And all we got to do is reprogram the bank's computers to operate with the let software instead of the interest-bearing software. Like a big PayPal at the Bank of Canada where you log on and instead of using your Visa card at interest, you use 100 hours of labor. And you can pay it back with Visa or your 100 hours of labor. And that way, you can trade internationally with an online PayPal backed by your time and not your collateral. So, new world coming, and I just hope that this is going to hasten the debate. I wanted to get it on record, the fun with which these lowly creatures are made fun of. And uh, I hope posterity enjoys this video, even if this generation's of dead slaves won't get it for a while. Oh.